A ver, te rasca. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our 12th uh, annual Court Watch Poland Conference. I'd like to welcome uh, judges of the Supreme Court, of the Supreme Administrative Court. I'd like to welcome uh, uh, judges from uh, uh, Voivodeship Administrative Courts, uh, uh, also uh, jurors, uh, representatives of the um, academic community, as well as our international guests. And so we've got uh, here our friends from Georgian Court Watch from Georgia, along with uh, the founder and leader, uh, Nazi Brola Janezashvili, and uh, welcome Bart van Mechen, the uh, LSR president uh, from the Netherlands. Also, I'd like to welcome very special guests and co-organizers and hosts of this conference, the volunteers of Courtwatch Poland, because it's due to the hard work for the past year that we uh, we're able to organize uh, this uh, conference. Today is a very special day. We are going to talk, uh, as always, about uh, very important things. But this time, we also invited uh, foreign uh, speakers. So it is for the first time that we've uh, got a bilingual setting at this event. I do hope that the panel on the, on judges' selection in various countries, along with guests from Ukraine, Georgia, and the Netherlands, uh, will be very interesting. But before we start it, we'll present a report on the judges' selection in the Netherlands. That is why, as an illustration of this conference, as the main motive, we've got a picture showing the, the building of uh, the Supreme Court in The Hague. But first, let us talk about problems caused by the pandemic to, um, for, for Polish courts. For this panel, we invited practitioners from courts and uh, people trying to safeguards uh, the rights of citizens uh, in the courts, also representatives of the Civil Rights uh, Ombudsman's Office. We are very happy to have a representative of um, a, an academic community here to a virologist who can tell us uh, about the methods to contain the spread of diseases in courts to use, which are best and which are, might be not uh, that good. So we are going to talk about very practical aspects uh, of um, handling court cases during the pandemic. Also, we are going to talk about the future and implementing new solutions in courts for good. In order to set some context for the first panel, uh, let us uh, show you the results of um, our study on a very important aspect, especially important to us, uh, what with the pandemic, the principle of um, openness of uh, court proceedings, which is je jeopardized uh, to a great degree during the, pandem during the pandemic. As of 2018, uh, we've uh, monitored the issue of openness and transparency, and we um, raised some alerts to the principle of transparency as uh, uh, one of our premises. Our volunteers uh, sit uh, in courtrooms as members of the public, as uh, can be the case for every person of age, not only journalists or representatives of foundations. 
Using this method, uh, the civic society might control the uh, transparency and the um, correctness of uh, court uh, proceedings. The transparency principle is also very important to the parties. It's not only about the internal transparency for the parties, but it's uh, also related to the fact that the parties can um, invite uh, their next of kin or independent members of the public to the trial. It's uh, increases the chances for a fair trial. As seen by the parties and members of the public. As of the outbreak of COVID-19 2020, we had five rounds of transparency monitoring in courts. It consisted in two elements. First and foremost, we analyzed the regulations uh, of uh, courts uh, directors on the principles of uh, presence in court buildings. Much to our concern, we saw how the problem of uh, COVID-19 was addressed by the Ministry of Justice which gave recommendations for court uh, directors to ban external access to the court buildings. Such bans included in ordinances and regulations were not substantiated by law in any way. Uh, they did not arise from any act of law, and they breached Article 45 of our Constitution and, the art and Article 6 of the European Convention for Human Rights, in our opinion. The above-mentioned provisions stipulate that in Poland everybody has the right to uh, transparent and impartial proceedings. It is impossible if there's no access to the court buildings. So the transparency and openness uh, was banned effectively. Altogether, we analyzed uh, 1,968 uh, ordinances and the regulations because we did five rounds of our monitoring, and including more and more courts as we went. So we added the um, district court and uh, the regional court in Sosnowiec on the way. Our volunteers also checked uh, the practical access to courts for members of the public. Well, theoretically, them could be no ban on public access to court buildings, but then in practice it turned out that the regulations curbed the opportunity to enter the building as arose from the policy of uh, court security. Or the judges prevented uh, members of the public from coming. We collated uh, nearly 800 observations over that period, sent uh, in by nearly 200 observers. What were the changes in the content of uh, regulations and ordinances? At the beginning, while reacting to the ministry's uh, recommendations, nearly half of court directors implemented uh, regulations which in practice uh, made the right to a public trial impossible. Either it was expressed verbatim or in uh, a given regulation there were certain enumerative lists of groups uh, of people um, allowed to attend the trials, but members of the public and journalists were not on the list. Normally, 
neither members of the public nor uh, journalists, not being the party to uh, the trial, are not summoned uh, to court trials, so they couldn't uh, come. Also, while we observe certain um, arbitrary limitations of access, uh, we sense uh, appeals to all set courts uh, asking them to change the regulations. Uh, and we saw uh, the changes in over 800 courts, which was um, a major success. As you could see, the share of courts with a total ban on uh, external access for members of the public dropped by 30 percent, which uh, continued to be the case uh, by mid uh, next year. But then in September 2021, uh, we saw further reduction of uh, uh, the bans. So clearly, the courts uh, altered the access policy. At present, um, since the last monitoring round, which was in May, as of the 30th of April, in only 10% of cases, there was um, a court ban on public access, and uh, then there were some uh, limitations and further 10% of cases uh, where the presence of members of the public was uh, up to arbitrary decisions of court directors. So the situation got much better. However, the problem is still there because there are certain bans and limitations in one third of uh, all courts, which is a major problem because uh, in fact, uh, the court trials are not uh, up to the Constitution or European standards in that they are not uh, uh, public. Uh, we are talking about uh, uh, two ad administrative courts, one court of appeal and uh, 30 district courts here. Clearly, the situation is uh, best uh, among courts of appeal and um, voivodeship administrative uh, court, and the problems uh, tends to be uh, uh, tend to be biggest in uh, district and regional courts. However, apart from official limitations, there are some practical ones. And here, let me give you some observations from our volunteers pertaining to courts without bans, where theoretically. Uh, there was public access to the courtroom. The first case was uh, the regional court in Poznań. And so the volunteer said, I had a minor problem entering uh, the premises. At first, the security guard told me that they, not, they were not open to the public. Uh, when I um, quoted uh, uh, the uh, legal provisions, uh, the security guard consulted another uh, official and uh, eventually uh, let me in. So clearly it was uh, only thanks to the determination and knowledge of our volunteer that he could enter. Otherwise, he couldn't. Another case was in Krakow. The volunteer said, I respectfully tried to explain it uh, to the security guard in the tent in front of the court building. Because during the uh, pandemic, uh, you have to know uh, tents were uh, put up in front of the court buildings uh, as an airlock for uh, people trying to access the court in Krakow. So I tried to respectfully explain my right to enter the courtroom. The security guard uh, told me that it was prevented by regulations, and he couldn't specify the regulations. And then uh, he said that uh, these were his orders, uh, and uh, he wouldn't explain whose orders and why. So as you can see, security guards 
give misleading information to uh, members of the public trying to enter the court. And it's solely thanks to the determination of our volunteers and the knowledge that they could eventually enter. And then the next example from Gdańsk. Unfortunately, it's still not easy to enter the courtroom. And it's, uh, we are already in the period uh, without face masks uh, uh, being compulsory. I sent my application on Monday. Why did he have to send uh, any application in the first place? But you have to know that in many courts, the regulations of court directors uh, limit access for the public in that uh, they make members of the public apply for a consent to enter the courtroom beforehand. The practice varies here. And only after some days following the application, he was given a consent. But it was an oral consent from the judge. And so he continues, I got no conf written confirmation, so the security guard wouldn't let me in. And then he said I was not in the system. I was not on the list. So no, yet another practice, uh, making lists of people eligible to enter the courtroom uh, based uh, uh, on uh, court dockets and trial uh, registries. And uh, quote unquote, uh, the mere consent from a judge is next to nothing because you have to negotiate uh, through other um, security employees. In uh, Tychy, our volunteer said, I, uh, at the beginning, the security guard wouldn't let me in because I was not on the list, but I uh, said that I uh, uh, emailed uh, a lady from the second penal division, and only then he let me in. So it's all in the practice. Another hurdle in participating in courts uh, uh, trials during the pandemic was the reaction of a judge. And I volunteer in Warsaw says, uh, I was asked to leave the room uh, because of the pandemic. I said I uh, had the right to be there as, members, uh, as a member of, a pub, uh, of the public uh, according to uh, uh, the regulations. And I was fitting within the limit of four members of the public to be present. And uh, then the judge uh, asked, uh, who let you in? Eventually, I left the room because I uh, uh, didn't want to argue. So at the end of the day, a member of the public uh, couldn't participate in uh, the trial because it was uh, prevented by the judge. Another case I'm going to revisit many times later on today it comes from the Warsaw uh, Praga District Court, the Division for Labor and Social Insurance. Before I went to court, I uh, made, I got familiar with uh, the regulation of the said court, and there was no counterindication uh, to come. And then the judge uh, started asking us who we are, who let us in, and why. Uh, we were largely dismissed, and uh, she wasn't all right with our being there. So we respectfully left and said we were sorry. At the beginning, it seemed funny to me, but then after some time, I really felt bad about it. Please note that this experience is not uh, a contact with any person. It's a contact with the court, which is expected to safeguard our rights. So this institution, which was supposed to safeguard our rights, dismissed our rights. It goes to show that the rights of um, members of the public, knowing uh, the Constitution, are being dismissed without any grounds. 
example, although there might be some reasons to limit certain rights, also in the Constitution, but it should be proportionate and it should be substantiated by the law, an act of law, ideally. Please remember that when it comes to banning the public from entering the courtrooms, the Ministry of Justice never came up with any draft uh, law to ban it or to limit it. It certainly recommended bans by regulations and ordinances um, of court directors, so it uh, shifted the responsibility onto them. And sadly, quite many court directors fell into that trap. And this was a case of infringing on constitutional rights of the public. A lot of other events took place during the pandemic which impacted the transparency of judicial proceedings. And I would like to draw your attention to these uh, events and I hope that we will discuss them. One incredible feat was, uh, were the online proceedings, the remote trials. These were supposed to, to safeguard our health because uh, we could use the internet, uh, video conferencing to contact each other and it prevented the spread of the COVID-19 disease. And certain problems arose uh, when our volunteers wanted to access uh, these remote proceedings, and they could not always participate in such trials. In some situations, our volunteers, although in line with common sense and uh, the procedures binding in a given court, would request links to join remote uh, proceedings. unfortunately encountered a situation where their requests were rejected or dismissed or they received actually no reasons, no grounds for this rejection, even though the trials were not held in camera, they were open to the public. Now, I will take the liberty to say this uh, because we received such information from our observers. Some judges believe it is unacceptable for the public to access remote proceedings because uh, the regulation which introduced such trials does not expressly state uh, that they are open to the public. But let me just highlight uh, that it also does not stipulate that they are banned from public access. But for some reason, certain judges question the possibility of the public accessing such remote uh, proceedings and they do not provide the links. And this is worrying uh, to us because we believe that uh, such uh, an interpretation of the regulation is not pro but anti-constitutional. But I hope uh, that uh, this will be an item of debate and I hand over to the moderator of our panel, uh, Piotr will be moderating. Oh, I can see here him behind the column. Ladies and gentlemen, a good morning, a warm welcome to all of you. It will be my pleasure to host the panel. And we have some excellent speakers and guests. And we will discuss uh, the lessons learned from the pandemic. We will discuss uh, the solutions that we should keep, that should stay with us, and those which we should bid farewell. And let me introduce our panelists. I would like uh, to ask Paweł Lewandowski, legal representative at uh, Domański and Zambrowski, uh, law office. Uh, he is a legal representative in numerous court and arbitration proceedings. He specializes especially in uh, construction work disputes. He has authored many cassation appeals to the Supreme Court. Uh, and he is also an expert in MNAs, especially of energy, insurance and construction companies. He also authored many publications on civil procedure. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Professor Krzysztof Pyrch. He is a professor of biology and virusologist, and he works at uh, the Biotechnology Lab of the University of Łódź. He specializes in virusology, especially 
mechanisms of spreading the disease and coming up with a new uh, virus treatments for people and animals. He has authored more than 180 scientific publications. I think that this uh, number is rising very quickly, but that's the most recent uh, information I checked up for this uh, this week. And the professor has also been involved in combating the spread of the COVID-19 disease. He was the deputy of the chair of the advisory team on COVID-19 at uh, the president of the Polish Academy of Sciences. And our third speaker is uh, Madame Karolina Weiss. She's an attorney at uh, the Department of Adversarial Procedure Proceedings at Allen and Overy uh, and Penjik Law Office. Uh, she uh, provides advisory uh, services in court and arbitration proceedings uh, to numerous uh, clients. She specializes in banking, in uh, foreign currency, loan laws, and other financial issues. And she also has uh, experience in enforcement uh, proceedings. And she received uh, uh, prizes in many competitions, for example, moot courts. Our fourth speaker is uh, uh, Mr. Tadeusz Zembruski, who is the chair of the civil procedure uh, um, faculty at uh, the Law and Administration Department of the University of Warsaw. He has uh, won uh, the court monitor editor you know, office uh, competition, and he has won it twice. In, in 2008, uh, for uh, his uh, publication on the Cassation Appeals and in 2017 for his monograph on civil procedure. He has received numerous awards uh, from uh, the management of the University of Warsaw uh, for his work at the Supreme Court. And we also have uh, Mirosław Wrublewski with us on the panel, who is the Director of Constitutional European and Human Rights Law at the department at uh, the Office of the Commissioner for Human Rights in Warsaw. In recent years, Mr. Director has cooperated or drafted statements of the Commissioner for Human Rights on uh, court proceedings in Polish courts and also at uh, the European Court of Justice. He specializes in political science and he authored 75 publications and articles on constitutional international European law and also on the protection of human rights. And Mr. Director also heads uh, the uh, Committee of uh, Human Rights at uh, the Bar Associ Association of Attorneys at Law. So a round of applause for our great panelists. That's a bit in advance of uh, their statements, but I think they have already well deserved uh, this uh, round of applause. And I think that you will clap for them even harder after they finish their discussion. Let me move a bit closer to our panelists. So we have Professor Pirch among us. He's a virusologist. And I think that he's best equipped to explain what we know about COVID-19 and at what stage of the pandemic we are at the moment. I am convinced that when we discuss law, we should also discuss um, our everyday realities. And we should know uh, what our situation is exactly. So the first question goes to Professor Pirch. After two years of the pandemic, almost three years of uh, the pandemic, because uh, the outbreak started in March, so a bit earlier. So what do we know about COVID-19? What stage of the pandemic have we reached? Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you to the organizers. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I must say that I'm always concerned about accepting such uh, invitations because I don't know what to expect outside of my virusology academic environment. When I listen to these stories about how the pandemic is being used at different levels and how it impairs our work, our functioning, then I'm really alarmed. 
because sometimes it just doesn't make sense of how the pandemic is being used. We've already discussed what is happening at the moment. The situation seems to be more complex, and that is true. In the first two years of the pandemic, things were simple. The society was, was exposed to the acute form of the disease. We were only learning everything about the virus. We didn't know how to defend ourselves. So the first infections were more acute. And we calculated the number of vaccinated people. We looked at uh, the gr uh, risk groups. And until the end of 2021, the situation was dire. And then we had the Delta variant, which appeared in the autumn. And at that point, uh, the society either received uh, their COVID-19 jabs or they uh, went through the disease. And we are closer to the EU average in terms of uh, the vaccination rate at the moment. So what is happening uh, now in autumn uh, 2020? Oh. Two, uh, we see COVID-19 as a secondary disease. So we've either already experienced the disease or we have been vaccinated. So we have a certain degree of in immunity. And the Omicron vi variant has appeared and it uh, causes an acute respiratory disease. We had a spring fall, then there was a summer wave. But uh, the infections uh, are not uh, translated into deaths, uh, which is uh, a good piece of news uh, because we're reaching a certain balance. Uh, much like uh, a century ago, uh, when the Spanish flu uh, first led uh, to primary infections, and then after some time, uh, these infections became secondary and milder. We still have uh, some unknowns. Uh, we think that um, this road to exiting the pandemic can be a bit bumpy because new variants of the disease will emerge. For example, local uh, variants. We have the elderly people. We have risk groups which uh, will develop acute forms of the disease. And this can take a couple of years until we reach a certain status quo, that uh, we will contract the disease, the virus uh, will lead in some cases to an acute form of the disease, but it will be seasonal and it will be treated like the influenza virus uh, where we will have updated vaccination. Thank you very much, Mr. Professor. Now we are well equipped with some knowledge about what lies ahead. And a question to Director Vrublevsky. From the perspective of the Office of the Commissioner for Human Rights, how do you see the situation of citizens in courts? Uh, Bartosz already told you about um, what our perspective was. But I think that the Office of the Commissioner, Commissioner for Human Rights takes note of uh, different uh, turbulences, difficulties that are experienced by our citizens in their everyday life. So I think that you can tell us about the problems experienced by the public in courts during this time. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation as well. But let me start uh, by thanking and congratulating the Court Watch Foundation for these observations. This is not the first year that I'm partaking in your conferences. And I get the impression that uh, if decision makers and courts uh, would hear you out, uh, would really listen to what you were saying, that we would have a different, uh, uh, a different judicial system. And there will be uh, less occasions uh, to criticize, criticize uh, the judiciary and accuse it of a lack of transparency or fairness. So just that comment on my side. Yes, we received information about problems in courts, but these were more fragmentary, more selective. We didn't conduct such comprehensive research. But they confirm uh, the observation that follow from your report. 
That is some um, restrictions in public access to courts in contacting courts. Apart from the uh, tent in Krakow, which was mentioned here, uh, we uh, saw, saw uh, photographs uh, of uh, boxes which were uh, placed outside the courts and uh, f for the public to put correspondence with courts in them. So that was a very weird uh, solution. At some point, uh, it was not possible to send emails uh, to the court. We know that that is still a problem with e-correspondence uh, with courts and a problem with digitizing the courts. This is not just a problem with, um, pr with um, hearings, uh, but generally with communicating with courts. Uh, we have some very dispersed, uh, very inconsistent regulations on e communication with courts. Despite the fact uh, that uh, a lot of work has been performed by the Wrocław uh, Center, supervised by Professor Gowartyński, this system still isn't perfect. It is at an uneven level across Poland. Uh, it follows from the civil uh, procedure uh, adopted in uh, 2015 that such uh, e-correspondence is possible. But it was not until COVID-19 that digitization forced our authorities, our courts, to accelerate taking the decisions on uh, e-hearings, on remote hearings in courts. Now, on the screen, we can see the question, what should uh, stay with us after the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic? And I think that remote sessions certainly should stay. As concerns regulations, the orders adopted by courts, uh, we agree that they were contrary to the Constitution. And the ordinances adopted by presidents and directors of uh, the courts were appealed against. And we got information at our office about that, too. Some uh, of uh, the uh, pres presidents and directors of courts would defend themselves and explain that uh, they received such instructions uh, from higher authorities. But uh, when we intervened, they would amend their ordinances. As concerns public participation in remote court hearings, I don't want to go into details about uh, the legal regulations and legal provi provisions, but courts uh, can take some arbitrary decisions about uh, executing such hearings. And they have a lot of liberty when deciding whether such a session should be open or held in camera. And we, at the Office of the Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, receive a lot of complaints about this. The Parliament has adopted uh, a regulation on, on this, and uh, this regulation sets forth that uh, restrictions apply during uh, the state of the pandemic and for a year after it ends. So we could ask, why do we need to keep these restrictions in force for one year after the pandemic ends, uh, when we can simply hold uh, these sessions openly to the public? So this gives rise to certain, to a lot of practical concerns. What has been mentioned a moment ago, public participation in public trials. This uh, concern was raised not just in courts, because we received also complaints about uh, communal councils, communal boards. More than uh, 10 communal boards introduced uh, similar restrictions and uh, they banned the public from entering uh, sessions, which should be open to the public. And uh, more than 10 communes still defend their regulations and do not want to withdraw them. Uh, 
Moving on to the remote court hearings and the decisions on holding a session in camera. Now we know uh, that uh, work is pending on uh, uh, legal regulations, especially concerning administrative proceed uh, proceedings. This is not just about uh, constitutional doctrine, but also about the impressions of the public who want to partake in court uh, sessions because they believe uh, this is their right uh, to express their opinions on certain cases. And therefore, it is so important to us. Uh, let me read. Oh, sorry. Let me turn off my phone first. So let me uh, read uh, an appeal we got at uh, the Ombudsman's office uh, just a week ago. The citizens are not happy, clearly. Uh, the court uh, decided to adjudicate on the uh, settlement uh, attempts. Uh, the session will not be transparent, and the citizen writes that it's uh, uh, a breach of law. Uh, we should be aware that at present the majority of restrictions were listed. You can go to, the, to a cinema, dance in the nightclub, or go to the hairdressers. And contrary to normal operation of the society, uh, in courts there's still a full-scale pandemic going on without any rational uh, justification. Since uh, going to the hairdressers or going to the restaurant assumes a certain degree of physical proximity, it's not the case uh, with a court session. And uh, a closed session devoids us uh, of a possibility to enter into any dialogue with the other party. And then the citizen uh, writes about the difference between uh, shopping at Biedronka discount store, which is 50 meters away from the court building, and uh, um, handling uh, a very important uh, life uh, 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 problem in court. And last but not least, the ombudsman uh, sees that certain uh, solutions seem irrational and they also breach the Constitution and that they curb the uh, uh, social contribution from jurors to the court proceedings. And excluding the uh, three-person proceedings, uh, limiting it to one person of a judge only. And there's um, a massive degree of uncertainty in courts because they don't know which procedures to follow. And it might uh, lead to a danger of uh, a court's um, decisions being lifted. It's a very valid problem. Thank you. Just like the director mentioned, sometimes the courts don't know how to follow the uh, provisions of law. I can remember of uh, one case where we intervened about uh, one of our volunteers who wanted to be an observer during a remote uh, session of one of Krakow-based courts, and it didn't happen. In our appeal, we uh, read that the uh, court uh, uh, director decided that uh, no observers of members uh, or members of the public were mentioned uh, in the regulations as the ones eligible for attending the session. But it's um, a mistake. Such an interpretation does not favor the Constitution or the civic society. Well, indeed, there is a problem interpreting the regulations clearly out there. And now, over to you, attorney, because um, we already know how the situation changed, uh, the presence of citizens in courts. 
but uh, the pandemic also changed uh, the uh, work of attorneys. How did it change uh, your way of working with citizens, with your clients, and uh, how did it change your communication with the courts? Are there any trends which are here to stay? And what about your experience in this area? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me here. What is it that the pandemic changed? Well, for sure, it motivated us to uh, uh, tap more into the technology. Well, before that, we had emails and telephone calls, but during the pandemic, we had more video calls. Uh, people were seeking a substitute uh, to face-to-face -face talks. We became experts in Zoom and MS Teams. We uh, implemented new terminology in our calls, like, for instance, uh, um, you're on mute or unmute yourself. However, there are many virtues to uh, remote talks because we can talk to people who are far away and uh, we can organize uh, larger meetings more easily. However, it calls for certain skills we didn't really give uh, much thought to earlier. We had workshops uh, in uh, in uh, legal speech and uh, body language, uh, making it easier to communicate with the client or with the court. And now there are trainings on how to set uh, a lighting in a Zoom camera and uh, uh, how to um, how to uh, speak to people on Zoom, how to um, arrange your background. So. Remote communication means uh, lots of virtues, but it also uh, means lots of vices. We didn't know uh, whether we should uh, put our guns, whether we should uh, stand up for the announcement of the verdict. Also, uh, written testimonies, how to approach them, and the many technicalities uh, had to be addressed, like uh, sending a link to the court session. Some time ago, if we got an email from the secretariat of the court, it could raise a red flag. But now it's uh, the new normal. We are emailed about uh, uh, rescheduling a court session or some delays. So we had to be versatile. And it made us uh, learn new skills. In the future, we'll have to choose whether we are uh, better off uh, with face-to-face -face, uh, contact or remote sessions. Thank you. Attorney mentioned her individual experience, but I'm really curious about uh, changing expectations of uh, clients or trial strategies. Maybe what with the pandemic, they turn to alternative routes like uh, arbitration or mediation on a larger scale, or maybe In those difficult times, uh, they decided to keep to universal courts to defend their interest. Thank you for inviting me here. Well, when it comes to your question, following what uh, the attorney just said, The virtual communication over Zoom or MS Teams was not just a challenge for courts. It was a challenge for the whole legal world, conservative as it is by nature. We, are all, we were all used to wearing suits and ties uh, 
during meetings with clients. We are used to being uh, cool and composed. The pandemic changed it all. We stopped seeing each other, and it had a bearing on our relations uh, with uh, our clients. Our clients were taken by surprise as much as uh, we were. So the whole communication between lawyers and clients uh, changed a great deal. Before COVID, sometimes you had to go to meetings with your very important uh, clients, decision makers or CEOs. And sometimes it took uh, 10 minutes. Uh, it, some, sometimes uh, the meeting took 10 minutes and uh, you had to travel across the whole city or, or fly to Tokyo for such a 10 minute meeting, not minding the cost. Now it's no longer the case. So this is what changed. When it comes to courts and the proceedings, we represent our clients in courts, so the contact between the clients and the court is indirect. I do believe that uh, in this new reality, the number of court cases is not shrinking. The proceedings uh, take ever longer, but it's not because of uh, the pandemic. It's because of other factors. When it comes to whether we choose the court of arbitration or universal court, it didn't change, really, because uh, the courts of arbitration were also confronted with COVID-related challenges. The standing courts of arbitration were always uh, quite flexible when it comes to uh, talking with the parties. And then the virtual world, virtual communication came and affected them as much as it affected everybody else. So they had to learn to navigate new challenges. So to cut the long story short, I cannot uh, see any change in the um, approach to courts, apart from the fact that we all uh, had some homework to do. Thank you. Well, at the end of the first part of our conference, uh, my question goes to Professor Zembrowski. We've seen a lot of changes implemented. Changes to the form of uh, sessions, uh, changes to the composition of the adjudicating teams. What do the changes look like against the backdrop of the whole legal system? Are they, are they part of some trends that were present before? Or maybe not so much? And uh, what impact does it all have uh, on the system? Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. Well, ladies and gentlemen, in courts, the pandemic is still going strong. When it comes to what it taught us, uh, we have to take a broader perspective because uh, if a citizen goes to court, they don't know what to expect because the, the rules might vary between courts and uh, locations. It's a bottom-up perspective. When it comes to uh, the top-down perspective and the bird's eye view, we could ask a question about uh, the shape our legal system is in. It's rather a question 
about how serious we are about the Constitution and the foundations of our judiciary system. Clearly, the pandemic uh, meant uh, certain difficult and painful decisions, abandoning certain rules. But the question is where it ends, where principles are still there and uh, wherever they are lifted by the reality check. What we are talking about, uh, uh, transparency and uh, impartiality is still there, however, in practice, we could see very worrying trends to abandon certain basic assumptions, like the principle of uh, open access or transparency, uh, serve it so beautiful, beautifully by the foundation. It's in the standards, uh, it's in the constitution, it's in the international law. However, in practice, we tend to lack this transparency more and more. Let me give you one example. When it comes to transparency, of course, uh, your research focuses on external transparency, a social check and uh, uh, checking the way courts work, but what's equally important is internal transparency, transparency vis-a-vis -vis the parties in uh, the trial. And at some point here, the pandemic-related regulations crossed the Rubicon. Why? Because before, there were some solutions allowing for non-transparency way uh, to adjudicate in uh, certain cases. But there was always the safety fuse where citizens had the possibility to block the non-transparent uh, way of um, uh, handling the trial. So uh, parties and citizens uh, could say no, could say that they wanted uh, to see the adversaries, but then they lost this uh, possibility. And the citizens lost their influence on whether the case is transparent or not. Well, of course, it should always be decided upon by the judge, by those who are in charge of handling the trial and the proceedings in the right and fair way. However, more and more we can see uh, that uh, the focus is on speed and efficiency, which clashes with uh, the principles we are trying to defend here. So finally, the question we should ask ourselves and the answer might not be what we want, is to what extent these simplifications or cutting corners will fade away along with the pandemic. We don't know uh, when the pandemic ends in two or, or five years, but there are so many questions to ask in this wake. To what extent the legislators will keep certain solutions uh, in place? Because even if the proceedings are not transparent, they are still there. So the question is, to what extent this uh, pandemic-related new normal is here to stay? 
Well, uh, so far, the situation has been very worrying in this area. Thank you. Before we continue our debates, uh, Let me tell you that there will be some time at the end of the session to ask questions and make comments. Uh, so you'll have opportunity to share your experience with the pandemic and the way it's uh, influenced your work and your experience. I think this will be the last half hour of our conversation here. But now, When it comes to the pandemic and its impact on the work of uh, judges, the new principle is to have uh, remote sessions. And let me read to you about the situation, about the cases where a judge can decide to opt for a traditional session. According to the legislator, we can abandon the remote setting wherever it's necessary and wherever a face-to-face -face session won't uh, uh, threaten the health and well-being of uh, everybody staying on the premises. So far, we lacked uh, systemic solutions addressing uh, the factor of uh, threatening uh, health and well-being. So uh, I'd like to ask P Professor Perch about the way uh, judges should decide and uh, on what grounds. Because I am not certain where I should get my knowledge from. Uh, if I'm correct, every Wednesday, the Ministry of Health publishes pandemic data. And I think we can interpret those results differently, but where should judges get their knowledge? How should they decide if this is uh, an excessive threat or not? Let me start by the fact that judges should not be dealing with this at all. For example, I shouldn't uh, be telling you what judicial, judicial proceedings should look like. So it's... Uh, it, it shouldn't be that judges have to decide because uh, they do not have the sufficient knowledge to do that. And it was not just judges, uh, the whole uh, legal, all legal groups, uh, everyone had to decide for themselves. And this is very dangerous uh, to have to take decisions uh, which uh, venture beyond their field of expertise. This leads to a situation where judges uh, depart uh, from uh, uh, the facts, uh, from uh, the scientific uh, data, and uh, every single court uh, or uh, city have their own practice and regulations. I was very surprised uh, uh, to hear what I've heard from you today, because the COVID-19 restrictions are aimed at spreading the pandemic, and they only make sense if uh, they are implemented everywhere, in schools, in hospitals, in courts. If uh, they are being exercised only in one type of institution, they are simply absurd, and they do not make any sense, because we're not aiming at saving a single life. We want to stop the spread in the whole society, and we want to reduce uh, the burden on uh, the public institutions, on health care. So I find it very difficult to, to respond to this question, to tell you how judges should take such decisions, especially that uh, they are forced to take such decisions. And that is contrary to their knowledge and experience. 
And they also face uh, the risk uh, that uh, if they take the wrong decision, they will be responsible for impairing the health and life of people. And that should not be taking place at all. All right. I think we can agree that this is not a good solution. Still, we are in this situation and judges have to take these decisions. So what is the source of information? What should they be looking at? The, the general rules are the same for everyone. The COVID-19 restrictions uh, cover all walks of life in the same way. Uh, we created a think tank at the Polish Academy of Scientists uh, of Sciences, and we set up a website with uh, data to give information with a broader perspective, also for business, for scientists, uh, and uh, we try to verify the information that makes sense. But I believe this is purely idealistic because you have to take decisions on restricting access to court hearings, and still. For example, today we meet here without any restrictions. So please visit the website of the Polish Academy of Sciences. That's what we created. Meanwhile, uh, this autumn, this fall, and the nearest future can be a bit bumpy. So we have uh, to keep checking up on the information and um, be in touch with reality. So be on the lookout for what is actually happening, not just looking at theoretical figures. And there is there is no additional sources that I can mention. It's just what we've been talking about um, here at the conference. Because when we meet at a conference like today, these restrictions make absolutely no sense. If I may respond, uh, because uh, I believe that we want to, this to be a lively discussion. In response to what the professor said, I think that we should introduce certain flexibility. The flexibility we lacked until now. And the system uh, was very orthodox and uh, very rigid. To give you an example, in the pre-COVID uh, situation, in line with uh, the Civil Procedure Code, if the witness were to be absent, uh, we had to provide a special statement and also a doctor's certificate. So the system was really tight and restrictive on this. Um, an absence was possible only for serious grounds uh, due to a disease and so on. Now, I've experienced uh, something on multiple occasions. At one of the courts, uh, we were to hear out a witness, and it turns out uh, that the witness failed to appear, and the hearing did not take place. I think that it was at one of the peaks of the pandemic. And the witness called the court and told the court uh, that they have not contracted COVID-19 yet, but they had contact with someone who is ill. So I don't want to say that this was um, an episode of panic, but uh, yes, the court decided to adjourn uh, the court hearing just because the witness uh, contacted someone um, with COVID-19. And so the hearing was postponed and nobody wanted any certificates, uh, just uh, oral information was sufficient. Everyone said, let's not contact that person. We all have to run away from the disease. So in a situation when we have this possibility of holding remote sessions, we should adopt such a flexible solution. If a judge wants an on-site session, then uh, the judge should collect information, for example, two days in advance. And they check up on the sint symptoms. And they can find out that a witness um, has a fever or a cough. And they can decide to hold a remote hearing. And I think that's the way things go in all environments, in business, um, in law offices, and so on. I, I think that Madam Attorney will confirm this. So I think that um, all uh, 
all the attorneys at law offices, even if they're sick, they won't call in sick, they will come in and work. They will be very hardworking because they have to keep their uh, deadlines and they can't let their boss down. That's what we're doing at the law office, and I think that uh, most entrepreneurs generally stick to the rule that if um, you have COVID-19 or you're sick, just don't come into the office. Stay at home, stay in bed, and you can work from home if, if you want to, because otherwise that will be, um, it will have a very damaging effect. And I would also like to refer to what uh, Madam, uh, Mr. Attorney said, and also the regulations on the remote sessions, the possibility, and that uh, a court can hold an on-site hearing only if there is no direct threat to the life and uh, health of uh, participants. I've never encountered uh, such uh, an ordinance uh, or such information from the court that the court has taken any measures to determine whether that threat is actually present. I've never received information about the safeguards to health that uh, a court decided to to implement. In one situation, we had uh, a planned hearing at the Court of Appeal, and a couple of days before that session, we received uh, uh, information that uh, there would be an on site uh, hearing. And the pandemic was only added at, at its outset, and we didn't know what the consequences would be. So we appealed that decision, we requested a remote session. And that was uh, the last hearing where we had our final addresses as uh, attorneys. Uh, we called the court, but our request was uh, ignored. And the secretariat told us that we have thermometers, so we can check your fever. We have uh, sanitizers at the courts, so, so we have um, measures uh, that uh, safeguard your uh, health. And the courts uh, would just deal with us, cope with the situation. Uh, by themselves, uh, take some arbitrary decisions without asking witnesses or participants what their health needs would be. And I think that now that we have uh, the information portal, uh, we have emails, and we can use those channels uh, to provide uh, updated information. And they could also check up on counter indications, such as uh, the professor just uh, mentioned. And then we could hold hybrid uh, hearings. Some people could come to the court, others could uh, join the meeting online. Some judges believe that um, it is not necessary uh, to hold on-site uh, sessions, uh, to hold hybrid sessions, sorry, because they um, believe there are only two possible options, online or on-site. So there is no possibility to combine them. So in this situation, we need to, to take the decision a couple of days ahead of the hearing to uh, decide whether we want an online, hybrid, or offline session. So I think we need an approach based on common sense. If we know that somebody is sick, then that person should not come in to work. And that should be the golden rule, not just for COVID, but generally in life. If I find out that one of my employees is sick, then I tell him to go home, because that's how things should work at the workplace, at the court. Because only in that way we can stop diseases from spreading. And I think that uh, this uh, might uh, seem very haphazard or random that we're calling our witnesses and asking about their systems. This uh, activity should be centralized. It sh there should be a uniform procedure for this. But we had uh, to find a way to navigate uh, the difficult pandemic situation. I saw that the professor wanted to take the floor. Yes, let me follow up on this issue. So the basic question, why should it be the judge who decides? Now, it's placing the responsibility on the judge's shoulders. Uh, the judges have their duties. Uh, they have uh, their uh, trials on uh, the docket. Uh, they have their duties. Uh, and what should they base uh, their decisions on? For example, if Professor Pirch uh, had to uh, visit each courtroom and decide which uh, trial is safe and which is not, well, that would make no sense. 
one solution which uh, I liked, which has uh, been withdrawn at the moment, there was uh, a thermometer used uh, to measure uh, body temperature. And I think that was reasonable. Unfortunately, I don't see it in courts now. Those people who looked sick or who had a fever could not enter the court. But I think uh, that uh, imposing this decision on the judge is um, a bad idea. But uh, to give you a positive observation, to appreciate uh, some of the solutions, then I would like to underline that remote hearings are a good solution. Not everything works out well. The links don't always uh, work. Or we have uh, bad quality of sound or uh, image. Of course, there are problems. But the pandemic has helped us with digitization. Let's just recall that before the pandemic, uh, we had regulations permitting e-hearings. Only you had to be based in a different court. And now uh, the participants don't have uh, to go to a court, a different court. They can be anywhere, in their car, in a law office, at home. They can join the meeting in the courtroom from any location. But the question is, where do the decisions, where are the decisions taken? Who has the competencies, who has the knowledge, who is qualified uh, to decide on whether it should be an online or on-site meeting? I have two more questions uh, for you that I've just come up with. The first one to Professor Zembrowski, and the second one will go to Mr. Director. But I would like to learn about your opinion, Mr. Professor, about how we uh, should develop uh, the digitization process. Should we have a different concept for every procedure? Because that what we witnessed during the pandemic. We had different solutions for the administrative, for the civil, for the penal procedure. Should there be one single procedure? Or should we perhaps introduce um, a code for procedure digitization? Should it be a law? Uh, maybe this sounds like science fiction to you. But how should we go about this? How should we push digitization forward? And I think this uh, was very clear in the Justiti uh, report on the, exper the pandemic experience of judges, and they really highlighted that every court uh, used um, a different software. Uh, they would uh, organize the meetings in uh, different ways. They used different programs. In what direction should we be headed for our digitization uh, to be reasonable and effective? And I think it's important for uh, the transparency of court hearings because it does have an impact on the openness of judicial proceedings. Thank you for this question. Let me give you a different perspective. Uh, let me discuss the example of the Faculty of Law and Administration of my university, the University of Warsaw. When the chaos ensued at the outset of the pandemic, well, everything was confusing. And then we had a bottom-up evolution of remote uh, sessions for students. And the same thing happened at courts. Uh, it was a bottom-up uh, development. And every lecturer used a different software, a different program. Everyone had their own rules. And we had to impose some regulations to unify this. And the same problem emerged in the judiciary. Only digitization is a problem which reaches beyond legal regulations. And we've been dealing with this for many years. And when we look at the uh, pre-pandemic period, uh, then we had practically no success in digitization. Uh, maybe certain small fragments of uh, the court procedure. And the pandemic accelerated this uh, change. Uh, and uh, what we need a lot of um, improvements and resources for is digitizing the archives of courts. Until we do that, uh, we will have kilometers of uh, paper 
documents of paper files. Without uh, digitizing the files in court archives, uh, we will not make this leap into digitization because uh, people cannot access the archives. Uh, and it was a great difficulty during the pandemic to access uh, court uh, files uh, and exercise uh, one's right of access. So this is a very important parallel channel uh, which we have to solve uh, at the same time. Uh, thank you uh, very much for your answer. And I would like to ask this question to Mr. Director, because as uh, Professor Pirch said, we have different solutions in every city and town. And it seems uh, that we have different constitutional standards of public access to courts uh, in every locality. And the observations of our volunteers also showed that the practice in dif is different in each court, uh, also the practice concerning remote hearings. So how did the pandemic influence uh, the homogeneity of uh, the right of access to courts, because I think this is an important and difficult issue that we will be coping with. This was uh, a question with a teaser, so I'm not going to argue with. Uh, well, of course, it was the case. It was not understood by um, citizens, and it has uh, little to do uh, with uh, where constitutional standards are followed uh, across various locations. But, uh, for instance, uh, in the constitutional uh, court, there was no pandemic. Even in uh, the peak period, uh, it held live um, sessions with social distancing and face masks. However, it successfully held uh, live uh, cases, although uh, the, um, it had um, in subsidiary cases the um, civil proceedings um, uh, code prevailed. But when it comes to the arbitrary uh, approach, even if uh, the session is uh, not open and uh, there's appeal against it because clearly citizens see it as uh, limiting the right to a fair trial. I believe Professor Zembrowski and I are on the same page here. We are in for a serious challenge. Professor Perch said that COVID is uh, used uh, to um, uh, glass over certain practices which are not really related to the pandemic itself. Certain regulations might curb the right to fair uh, trial and the right to access to court in many dimensions, internal and external. An important objective of uh, the regulations is uh, addressing another problem, uh, which is uh, too long uh, procedures. So uh, sooner or later, the pandemic will be over. The vaccinations will uh, change uh, the game, because uh, even if we are sick, uh, we uh, it's uh, not very serious. What with the number of uh, tests, like a million tests purchased in August, it clearly shows that uh, COVID is still here. But we have to ask ourselves what is more important, open access in various areas or speed and efficiency of trials. Well, changes are necessary in many areas. Maybe some less openness uh, 
for better speed and efficiency. However, in the case where there is no health hazard, but there is a strong need for a citizen to argue their case reliably, we should take a different uh, approach. Using COVID as an umbrella argument is no longer applicable. It's about uh, what we value most in the Constitution. I think it requires a serious uh, communication between legislators and uh, civic organizations based on uh, reports and studies like the one from Court Watch, and I hope it does happen. Thank you. So, uh, I think if uh, you have any questions or comments, uh, we can handle them now. We'll approach you with the microphone. So please uh, first introduce yourself and uh, share your experience or ask a question, specifying the addressee. I'm Wojciech Mazur from the Supreme Administrative uh, Court. I've got a perspective of a practitioner, a judge, and a person running the biggest administrative court in Poland, which is the provincial administrative court in Warsaw. We, all, uh, we are all aware of the difference uh, uh, between universal courts and the administrative courts. Uh, it uh, goes without saying that the pandemic uh, uh, made a lot of harm. But I do believe uh, that administrative courts handled it uh, quite well. Well, it is a fact that the majority of cases uh, were addressed uh, during closed sessions. But uh, when it comes to administrative courts, uh, uh, there is a certain advantage for closed sessions in Poland and in other EU countries. I am aware that uh, of the um, attitude of the civic society uh, to courts, because we imagine that uh, a court is a courtroom. But we know that uh, Apart from some exceptions, there are no um, evidence proceedings and everything is addressed in writing in administrative courts. Just like Director Wroblewski said, we were trying to reconcile between certain principles, uh, preventing the citizens from waiting for uh, the case uh, to be heard for many years. Sometimes, if it takes three or four years to hear uh, mm, the verdict in your case, it is too late. However, I do agree with what, professor, what the professor said about the regulations. In the Warsaw Administrative Courts, uh, we were not leaving everything uh, up to the judge, uh, we were based on recommendations of the Ministry of Health. We've been trying to be guided by the interest of the citizens. At present, what with uh, the civic interpretation of uh, online hearings and the provincial administrative court uh, in Warsaw, we've had hybrid sessions for over a year. This is, uh, mind you, 
the only competent court for um, adjudic adjudicated in relation to the decisions of central bodies. And if um, citizens wish to come in person, it's not a problem, although it is uh, impossible for the Supreme Administrative Court. According to the regulations, the party doesn't have to be in the courtroom in person, but it doesn't mean uh, that they mustn't be there. But there, are, th there is work going on on amending the regulations uh, for administrative courts, uh, allowing for hybrid sessions. I think it is very much advisable, especially uh, for provincial administrative court in Warsaw, because we have parties from all over the country. And uh, if uh, uh, the party's attorney comes from Rzeszów or Szczecin, they can, uh, it's easier for them to have an um, online connection with the court than to come in person. So I think it's good and it will be good uh, for the future to have hybrid sessions. But when it comes to um, competition between effectiveness and uh, openness, uh, the rule of thumb should be uh, to have a closed session for our court uh, unless it is advisable otherwise. So this is my practical perspective and practical experience. Well, I hope that the pandemic will soon be over and we'll be back to normal. But just like Director Wroblewski mentioned, the regulations are still there, but the legislators uh, should be flexible. We can't just uh, sit and wait for the pandemic to be over. We need some normalcy. If you can go to a theater or to a restaurant, why uh, shouldn't uh, you be able to come to court? I'd like to thank the foundation, the Court Watch Foundation, for uh, what you do. We are in uh, close touch with uh, the head of the foundation, and we value your input very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, over to another speaker. Welcome. I'm uh, Rafał uh, Wagner from the first uh, civil division of the regional court in Warsaw. I've got some practical experience to share. So we uh, were talking about why the regulations are here to stay uh, one year after the pandemic is uh, over. Well, the practice in Warsaw is that the majority of uh, sessions are um, scheduled uh, with uh, a year or two, a year or two in advance. So going back to the old ways overnight would cause a turmoil in the calendar. If we are back to three person adjudicating teams, we it would mean eliminating two people from the team overnight. Hence the lack of flexibility. I can guarantee that what we planned for the next year will be implemented. However, the problems are there. Judges are planning one year in advance, not a week or two in advance when it comes to the um, presence of elderly witnesses in court and ensuing health hazards. Last year, for instance, uh, uh, the peak of the pandemic only came in the summer. So it would be good for the judge to be guided by the flow of the pandemic waves uh, while making decisions. But all parties really are, are really interested in uh, uh, the session 
and, and the trial to be there, but um, the practical experience shows that frequently one of the parties is not interested in uh, adjudicating very fast. Maybe you don't know, but at present, judges have the possibility to adjudicate from home. And it did happen. Uh, it happened twice to me, where the judge uh, was COVID positive, feeling all right, uh, uh, mm, had uh, online connections and adjudicated and run the uh, trials and the um, uh, proceedings from home. So, in practice, it's more about it's, it's less about um, health hazards for specific participants, but more about the methodology of the judge's work. For instance, in divorce cases, uh, family judges are reluctant to have remote sessions, uh, remote trials, because frequently lack of direct contact with the party can uh, um, have a negative bearing on uh, the result. Well, if you talk to attorneys uh, and the parties are there, we can communicate freely on the go. And the judge has to think about possible ways of distorting the case uh, uh, when they have no uh, direct contact where they cannot see what the attorneys and the parties are doing. Also, there's yet another very important uh, technical problem. If, uh, with a very short notice, it turns out that uh, one party is physically in court, and we decided to have a remote uh, trial with both parties, then there's a problem with uh, access to the judge. It's easier to make a good impression when you're physically there than when you're in front of a Zoom camera and the quality of the connection uh, might be compromised. So then the party participating remotely is worse off, and the result might be worse for them. So there are many elements to consider when we decide whether the trial will be hybrid, remote, or uh, physically held in, on the court premises. I do hope that when the pandemic's uh, truly over, the remote uh, trials uh, will stay as a facultative uh, form because uh, they changed the methodology of work of attorneys. Because formerly, it took two days uh, to have a trial when the parties came from uh, remote uh, places in the country. Now it takes two or three hours. So it simplifies. Uh, some cases a great degree, but uh, not everywhere. We'll see what happens. Thank you. There are reactions at the panelists' table, and I can see three further questions coming. We still have 15 minutes to go in this part of our conference. So could you please be brief? And then the rest of the discussion will uh, happen over coffee during the break. I'm Agata stankiewicz -Rata. I'm a judge uh, from a regional court in Katowice. Uh, I listened carefully to what you said. I think the courts had a major problem with all the situation. And in many cases, we um, uh, we failed, uh, but in many other cases, we succeeded as well. Well, the professor here mentioned uh, 
common sense. And I think this is the name of the game. We were seeking solutions for our context. And just like you said, we were listening to uh, medical professionals setting uh, social distances, uh, putting green tapes on the floor, showing you where to stand and where not to stand. We were trying to care for uh, the well-being of uh, uh, the visitors. We had disinfectants, face masks. We were reacting on the go to this very worrying situation we were not prepared for. On the other hand, however, we had a sizable group of per uh, persons uh, who refused to believe in the pandemic, and they uh, wrote uh, all kinds of complaints about having to disinfect their hands, wearing face masks, and uh, entering the courtroom uh, um, when there were some uh, limitations. We were trying to address this problem. In Katowice, we had uh, lots of uh, demonstrations from uh, persons claiming that the pandemic was uh, uh, fake. Uh, we um, were listening to what the media said, and it was not easy to navigate this issue. The professor said that the pandemic uh, is uh, still uh, continuing. In some courts it is present, in some it is not. We try to meet with people and to cope with their situation, with their fears, with their problems. And we have to deal with many circumstances uh, that are unpredictable for us. And the professor also said uh, that uh, today without a certificate uh, of, of a doctor or uh, without a statement, uh, we adjourned a case uh, because the witness called in and said that they uh, had come into contact with uh, someone with COVID-19 disease. Uh, Mr. Professor, if that was me, I would have adjourned the case as well. If that was March 2020, when everything came to a halt, I would have postponed that uh, hearing as well. We need uh, to um, act in line with common sense, uh, and that's what I would do. You don't have to convince me that transparency, openness is the founding principle of the judiciary. That's why I'm here, because I believe in that. But we have to keep up with uh, the uh, reality, and it's not clear-cut. It's not black and white. Uh, you mentioned the need for digitizing court files. Please bear in mind that there are so many people who fail uh, to use the computer. They don't have digital skills. Uh, they um, cannot access uh, electronic devices. I've been a judge for very many years, and I am convinced or almost certain that we cannot use one solution for all courts in Poland. And to come to an end, because we could debate this issue for many hours, I want to highlight one exceptional, fantastic success we have due to the pandemic. Now, in cases about incapacitation, we can act remotely. When uh, the people, uh, for example, these cases concern the disabled, people with uh, mobility problems, and for them it is um, difficult uh, to appear physically in a court, uh, and we can help them out. So we can uh, hold an online session. Uh, we can, uh, they can join from medical facilities, and most uh, medical facilities accept the fact and permit uh, their patients to join an online hearing, and I think that is a success. That is added value. Of course, there's a lot of disadvantages, but many advantages as well, as in all life situations. So I think that we've uh, actually done quite a good job uh, during the pandemic, especially in large agglomerations, for example, the one I come from. It was uh, very difficult, very challenging in terms of uh, the number of cases on the docket. So thank you. Just uh, one comment. I agree with uh, the need for common sense, but we also have uh, the sanitary institutions uh, that we have uh, to listen uh, to. And uh, 
if uh, we have another wave in the autumn or if something happens in a year or two, we have uh, to keep uh, be on the lookout for uh, biological hazards and common sense might not be sufficient in such cases because we have to feed facts, uh, uh, scientific facts uh, and evidence into our common sense. We can't only base our decisions on experience. Uh, so that's why I don't want to take such decisions uh, because I'm a virologist. I don't know even how to enter a court. Uh, I am a court uh, at uh, the uh, regional court in Lublin. A lot of comments that I've heard are uh, very apt, but we should be referring to transparency, which is uh, the light motive of this conference. A couple of comments from me. I've experienced the pandemic at the courts and also at our national training institution for judges. Mr. Professor, Madam Attorney, as you are working at your law offices, you don't have to think about openness and transparency. You only have to take it into account when you meet with us in courts. You are not restricted like we are at the courts. Of course, we should keep the possibility of remote hearings. That's obvious. But from experience, uh, from uh, the courts and from the national uh, school, which uh, went online after a week from the outbreak, numerous in uncountable problems emerged. For example, is our server based in Poland or is it based in the US? That was one of the problems. In the media and YouTube, uh, you can uh, view many uh, US online court sessions uh, which were held online. Where we, c we can't do that because uh, uh, our server needs to be in Poland. And of course, questions about uh, issues connected with software. We can't use software uh, which does not protect uh, the data. The court is uh, a public institution and is subject to such limitations. Uh, you as a law office uh, can select Zoom and contact your clients across the country and across the world. So that's one important issue. I have the questionable, questionable pleasure to uh, come into close contact with uh, the healthcare service uh, during the pandemic. So if you could please explain to me and to every uh, Polish citizen, if you could explain one thing, if we if you have the transparency and openness principle, why was was it banned to visit patients during the COVID-19 pandemic? Families, friends, caretakers could not enter the hospital. And is that not an infringement on constitutional law? So, and for two weeks, more or less, I was at the hospital. Uh, I could only see the eyes of uh, healthcare personnel. I had no contact with my family. I only received text me messages. No one could even pick me up from the hospital once my treatment was over. So we haven't uh, been concerned about this. Um, so this, the state of the pandemic when it was announced uh, did, did not um, uh, change much for me because before the pandemic, uh, maybe I had five observers or five members of the public at my hearings. So if we looked uh, at the statistical information, if if we wanted to check uh, the increase of uh, public participation in hearings, perhaps your employees uh, who perform these analyses uh, at uh, if we, we had 800 people participating in the hearings, then maybe we could calculate that. I know that so the situation is different in each court. The pandemic didn't change anything for me because my courtroom was empty. I just had the parties participating. And I would like to end with a question. 
we've mentioned uh, this this person who called in uh, to the courts uh, who had contact with uh, a COVID-19 patient. If they did enter the courts and uh, they said that if, if they tried to enter the courts, although they had contact with uh, somebody who contracted COVID-19, would they have been let into the court? What do we give priority to? protecting the health of uh, those present in the court because that person was not subject to a quarantine or isolation. That person did not develop symptoms of the disease yet. In my court, the situation was such that uh, no hearings could have taken place because most uh, judges and staff contracted COVID-19. And at some point, I had no one who could accompany me in the courtroom. So let's say we enter that um, person who called into the courts. We have people who don't want to wear masks. If you could please just clarify which panelists should answer. Okay, an open question. And I saw one more raised hand. But please be very brief. And if you Pavel Miko, I took a quick question. Can a judge require that one of the parties to a hybrid session, that that person will be alone in a room or that the camera be pointed at the door or the room so that the judge can be sure that nobody enters the room during the hearing? One more question. Szleminga Gość, um, Regional Court in Gdańsk, about uh, hybrid hearings and access. What if the court decides that the hearing is heard in camera and we have a request for online publication for an online hearing so that the attorneys can participate? We are departing from that more and more often. We want to publish uh, the judgment on site at the court because uh, that undermines uh, the seriousness of the court. Because uh, oh, we, the participants should rise uh, when the court uh, speaks, but they don't do that when they partake in online ses sessions. So should we publish uh, such uh, judgments, announce the judgments also during online sessions? And sometimes, um, uh, and, and uh, would not publishing the link to such an online hearing when a judgment is announced would be an infringement on the principle of transparency. Uh, so the question goes first. Questions go first uh, to Dr. Zembrzuski, and uh, the uh, first question is an open one. Uh, if anyone would like to take the floor, please go ahead. The first question, if uh, I recall correctly, was about uh, was about how we should uh, protect our health. Uh, should people who had contact with the COVID-19 disease be allowed to enter the court? Uh, what should the priority uh, be? I have a very soft uh, heart, uh, so I've um, permitted more questions than we have time hope for, but I hope that we will continue this discussion also informally and on other occasions. Mr. Professor, let me answer uh, to the last question. So the influence of the judge on how the camera uh, is used, uh, the presiding judge influences uh, the procedure of uh, the judicial proceedings, but how do we enforce that in an online session? As concerns announcing judgments uh, online, I've had some experience with uh, this situation. So it was um, a, a, a bit comical uh, in my experience uh, when uh, the participants had to rise uh, to hear the uh, judgment, but um, actually it was more efficient when we had an online session. So that was just a, a general reflection. Um, 
I have a general reflection. Can I just add them at the very end of our session? Uh, let me just compliment uh, the intervention of Mr. Professor. Let me draw from my practice. So checking whether the witness uh, is um, healthy and non-infectious. I've received a couple of such requests from attorneys. In those situations, there was um, a sus suspicion that the witness was not testifying uh, on his or her own, and the judge requested that the computer be uh, turned round, rotated, so that he could see the whole room because he wanted to make sure that uh, the witness was alone in the room. I've had a lot of online uh, hearings, and it was always the case that the witness was testifying freely. So it was not a problem in my experience. Let me give you one experience of mine about the seriousness of the court. I don't know uh, how to interpret it, but the judge was using the uh, camera so that he was not visible, but the eagle in the emblem of Poland was clearly visible. From a non-legal uh, point of uh, view, I would like to comment from a non-legal uh, point of view. So the hospital issue, why was there no access for the family or friends? So when uh, a disease is a public threat, uh, we have a law that stipulates that. We have regulations. When we try to s stop the spread, when we want to protect our public, we need isolation. If someone has tuberculosis, we don't want them to come into this room and cough at us because that person is a threat. Uh, so that is the same case in um, in the pandemic situation. If someone is uh, has contracted the disease, uh, they can uh, transmit the disease, then they are a threat. And if the witness uh, could have contracted the COVID-19 uh, disease, uh, they are a threat, never, irrespective of the fact whether uh, they reported that they need to be isolated or quarantined. Uh, it should be reported uh, to our sanitary institutions. Because that person, the witness, but also the court staff uh, have to make sure that there is uh, no hazard uh, to uh, the health and life of uh, court participants. Because these principles have not been adopted to, to protect single lives, uh, for example, the elderly. Uh, we need to protect the whole society. And we need to really keep to the health uh, safeguards, uh, use masks properly and not let our nose stick out from above the masks. So from my perspective, a non-legal expert, uh, th this is how I try to approach this also in everyday life. I don't wear my mask, although oh, there are, it is highly likely that there is someone with COVID-19 in this room. Just one or two sentences, uh, please, and, and please be very concise. Just uh, to complement what has been said, I would actually like European courts to keep uh, the online hearing session. We had one last year, which took one hour. I just came back from the European Court of Justice in Strasbourg, and I only had um, I only needed 12 minutes uh, to state my case. And the European Court of Human Rights, just before uh, the trial, whether it's on site or online, they have a couple of minutes for a meeting uh, to explain all the technical issues. And everyone knows how they should uh, proceed uh, during uh, the hearing. And the European Court of Human Rights was very clear. They told us, uh, don't stand up when uh, the court enters, because I do not want uh, the view of your trousers uh, during uh, the hearing. And Mr. Professor, 
Just uh, two sentences to round us off, uh, one about practical issues, the other one about the system. I'm afraid that in terms of the COVID-19 regulations, it will be difficult uh, to depart from them uh, as uh, in the next uh, couple of uh, months, uh, it, we will probably have to prolong the proceedings to the, the COVID-19 restrictions. It's, um, it's a decision between a quick but um, not really due process or a long and due process. It's uh, difficult to decide for different cases because uh, business cases, family cases are completely different. In business cases, we just need the facts. In the family cases, we need to see those people. And I have um, some food for thought uh, for you. If a party requests an open proceeding, then we need to provide such a proceeding. And we're at the point that we need to demand transparency and openness. And this is alarming because the Constitution does not state uh, that we need to require openness. It should be granted to us uh, uh, free freely. And just uh, a sum up of this session, Madam Attorney, I think that everything has been said. Thank you, and let us close our panel here. We'll have a coffee break now until uh, half past 12. I would like to thank our participants, our online viewers, and we will meet back here at 12.30. Thank you.
Witamy bardzo serdecznie po przerwie w drugiej części naszej konferencji. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. In this part of our conference, we'll talk about selection of judges. Before we start our panel, let us discuss the most important findings of our report. Apart from the openness monitoring, the Courtwatch Foundation published a report on the independence of judiciary and the Kingdom of the Netherlands and the way it's being safeguarded by the judge selection system. Why the Netherlands as a model? There are several reasons for our decision. But soon you'll see that, first and foremost, the Dutch system is very mature in that for many years already, the Netherlands have used uh, some solutions which might seem innovative to us, but uh, still are present in other branches of economy, like the methods of uh, the selection of um, uh, certain positions based on skills and competence. In the case of uh, judges, it resulted in quite a unique and very interesting system. I'm going to uh, tell you a few words about it, and then you'll hear from the head of the Judge Selection Committee from the Netherlands. But the Dutch system is not only unique and innovative, it's very special in terms of uh, its results. The Dutch judiciary is uh, evaluated as uh, very good. For instance, by managers, it's evaluated as part of top five uh, independent judiciary systems out there. 77% of uh, citizens of the Netherlands, according to Eurobarometer study, evaluate the judiciary as uh, good or very good. In the study, consisting in self-evaluation of the Dutch judiciary system, order to an external company, it shows that 82% of uh, citizens uh, who had a trial in the Dutch uh, uh, court think that the, the judge was uh, impartial. It's an impressive result. And uh, this is the objective of our foundation, to have um, a judiciary system which is thought very highly of by the society. That is why we selected the example of the Netherlands. Such impressive results are due to many other factors than the judge selection system itself. The latter is uh, rather an outcome of uh, the philosophy behind the judiciary system in the Netherlands. And this philosophy was developed uh, over many decades, even centuries because the independent Dutch judiciary has been growing for many years. When Poland was uh, fighting for independence, uh, the Netherlands uh, could uh, 
develop its systems. Although formally founded um, in uh, the early 19th century, it was uh, its predecessor was um, the Association of Independent uh, Provinces of the Netherlands. And it brought about this unique culture. This culture being uh, one of the pillars of the international judiciary and international uh, law. The Dutch uh, judges not only applied the local law, but they also followed uh, the international moral law regulating, uh, for instance, commercial relations. So uh, it was always important uh, to the Dutch judiciary to follow such standards. Well, uh, the Dutch judiciary system developed, uh, but uh, there was um, one intermission in this development course, uh, which was the Second World War. And we had such intermissions in our development as well, uh, uh, because uh, we are affected by the Second World War and then the communist era. So it's very interesting how the Dutch judiciary tackled uh, the situation uh, when uh, they were under German control during the Second World War. You can find all that uh, in uh, the report, which is available from the um, Courtwatch Foundation webpage under the top uh, reports. So uh, first and foremost, uh, during the Second World War, during the um, German occupation, uh, the Dutch judges never stopped working. However, there was some influence uh, on the judiciary. For instance, the occupants uh, dismissed the uh, head of the Supreme Court because of his uh, um, uh, non-Aryan uh, lineage. They also uh, lowered the um, retirement age of judges. Uh, they implemented uh, the position of the justice of peace to give way to representatives of um, various organizations, to um, various German organizations uh, or national socialist organizations. Uh, to the system. A part of uh, the Dutch uh, society collaborated with uh, the occupants. Um, some of them were made judges over that time, too. On the other hand, uh, some say that the judges were not assertive enough and never appealed against uh, or opposed um, against the uh, dismissal of the said Supreme Court head. But there were some positive cases as well. For instance, the Dutch judges uh, adjudicated uh, fines against uh, the regulations, justifying that uh, um, the Punishment consisting in uh, staying in labor camps for many months uh, were not uh, uh, matching the uh, offense. Uh, so they uh, adjudicated uh, lower punishments, um, and uh, they were dismissed for that too. And then after the Second World War, special courts were appointed to adjudicate in uh, um, trials uh, for um, perpetrations during German um, occupation. And the majority of um, uh, collaborants were devoid of their positions, but um, the majority of them were reappointed. Only some of them were not. Those who, in the eyes of judges and jurors, uh, 
were not in line with the spirit of the international and Dutch uh, law. In many countries, uh, going from authoritarian to democratic uh, systems, uh, there is a certain degree of transition um, justice. Poland was uh, devoid of it after the communist times, although there were some attempts at establishing it. Uh, recently, I uh, watched 1994 interview with Professor Strembosz, um, and he said he wasn't happy about uh, This continuation of this transition justice, uh, what with the left winning the next elections, and he wasn't happy about the lack of uh, mechanism to punish judges who adjudicated uh, during the martial law when uh, the state council was illegally creating uh, uh, certain regulations, and the judges adjudicated based on those regulations. Uh, uh, he said that um, such cases um, required special analysis, and uh, in his opinion, at least several dozen judges uh, really deserved being dismissed uh, as a punishment. Uh, which never happened. Even years later, the Institute of National Remembrance was uh, trying to uh, uh, read the cases, uh, but to no avail. So uh, there never came a settlement of those uh, times, but it did come in the Netherlands, although their transition period was much shorter than in our case, and it had much uh, smaller bearing on the, ju on the Dutch uh, judiciary. And uh, interestingly, even judges uh, being part of this, the occupant system did not uh, adjudicate um, along their lines. They uh, never promoted national uh, socialist uh, policies, which was the case in uh, Germany, for instance. For details, please consult the report. I just wanted to tell you that uh, there was uh, uh, some, albeit symbolic, uh, purging period after the occupation in the Netherlands. Another important element is the way to select Supreme Court judges in the Netherlands and uh, uh, its evolution. From a form of perspective, the system stayed unchanged since uh, the early 19th century, since uh, the Constitution and the uh, Court Organization Act. The first uh, judiciary teams were appointed by the king in an arbitrary manner, but uh, over the next uh, terms, when judges retired, the vacancies were filled based on uh, recommendations from the Supreme Court judges. They came up with um, six-person uh, six lists to the parliament, and that the parliament uh, presented a short list of uh, three to the king. Um, however, the parliament was not bound by the recommendation. Theoretically, they could come up with a list of very different candidates uh, than those um, suggested by the Supreme Court judges. And over the turn of the 19th and the 20th century, indeed, uh, the parliament uh, did exercise this right, um, added some candidates or left uh, some out because they had their preferences. But uh, slowly, yet steadily, the parliament uh, left uh, the recommendation to the Supreme Court judges. Similarly, the king appointed the first person recommended by the parliament, and if uh, 
Uh, he didn't. It was uh, because uh, the said person resigned from um, some personal, for some personal reasons. So, in this solution, in this system, uh, both the parliament and the king could influence who could become the Supreme Court judge. As of 1947, it uh, never happened that a different person than the top uh, person recommended by the Supreme Court was appointed as a Supreme Court judge. So we might say that the monarch ceded uh, his power and the parliament ceded their power to recommend a candidate for a Supreme Court uh, judge. But formally speaking, they still had uh, this possibility. So any time the parliament could exercise its uh, right to recommend uh, different candidates. But uh, they don't do it. The question is, uh, why? Well, the session of power to the judiciary might be explained by the trust of politicians for judges. Because we might imagine the MPs uh, recommending um, different persons, but uh, they didn't because they trust uh, the choice uh, of and the decisions of the Supreme Court judges. Well, Article 120 of the Constitution of the Kingdom of the Netherlands uh, includes a provision banning the possibility of a judge questioning the constitutional nature of um, a law, which does not mean that the judges do not uh, question uh, the compliance between the laws with higher order uh, law. Because uh, traditionally and naturally enough, uh, the Dutch judges were guided not only by the constitution, but also the inst uh, international law. And even now, when we ask about this ban on questioning or checking the constitutionality of uh, laws, uh, the judges reply, but we do check the uh, compliance with uh, the um, European Human Rights Charter, which uh, might take pre uh, precedence uh, over the law. But such situations are very, very rare. So effectively, there is no conflict between the judiciary power and uh, the legislative power. Maybe because of that, the level of trust and confidence is so high. It all led to a system where independence of the judiciary is very far reaching. Although soon we'll know how much. How far? Because uh, in Georgia, the judges uh, themselves manage the judiciary. So the majority of the competences uh, held in Poland by the um, Ministry of Justice is taken over by the Judiciary Board. The Netherlands have the Judiciary Board or Council as of 2002. But this institution was appointed for a different person and uh, for, for a different purpose and um, in different composition than here. Here you can see the door to the uh, National Judiciary Council. It has five members, much fewer than in Poland and other countries exercising this tradition, which is characteristic for of countries like Italy or France or Spain. So it's much smaller, but it has predominantly managerial competences. They manage the budget of the judiciary and give out regulations binding for judges and the judiciary. And they also supervise the process of judge selection, but they do not run the process. The National Judiciary Council in the, in the Netherlands uh, uh, does not uh, select the judges. 
it has uh, certain decision-making competences, but the whole process is uh, uh, exercised by another body, which is LSR, uh, which is LSR. I'm not going to read it in uh, Dutch because uh, it wouldn't uh, sound uh, well to the ears of our Dutch guests. But uh, this is the National Judge Selection Committee, DLSR. You can see this committee in um, the picture. This committee runs the whole process. It's not uh, held by the Judiciary Council. The Judiciary Council members can focus on the management of universal judiciary, also um, including administrative court. The Supreme Court is still separate. The National Committee for Judge Selection is much more numerous than the Judicial Council. Of course, it evolved over different stages. At the moment, it's uh, more than 20 members. Part of them are judges. Others uh, are um, professionals uh, who are not judges. Uh, they can be experienced lawyers, for example, learning at uh, working at law offices. Some do not have a legal education, but they have experience in recruitment, in uh, managing operations in different branches of the economy. The LS LSR looks for people who can add, um, draw from their business experience. Uh, uh, for example, they can, uh, they can select a mayor of a large city, a, a former president of a large uh, company, a uh, movie director, so people with uh, different life experience, and they legitimate uh, this uh, committee because they reflect different groups of the society. And uh, the Judicial Council itself is composed not just of judges, but also of non-judges, but experienced managers. And there must be at least two of them in the council. The LSR has uh, a very interesting operational procedure. And it has uh, been created for to meet one objective. And the goal is to recruit judges who meet a certain profile. That's the basis recommendation that follows from a Dutch experience. That's one lesson for the Polish system. So judges are not recruited on the basis of a subjective or arbitrary decision of the selection committee. Judges are selected if they fit a certain competency profile. And this profile of skills and knowledge is composed of 69 competencies, if I recall correctly. And they are grouped according uh, to a field or area. It's a very clear, legible uh, document. And you can quickly understand who the LSR seeks. What's interesting is that out of these 69 competencies, only two are directly linked to legal knowledge. Others are about social competencies, about communication skills, about um, what that person knows about the society. And the report has already been published online, so we can read about it in detail. The first competency on this list, one of the key competencies expected from a judge, is social awareness. So a candidate uh, knows what the developments in society are. The candidate uh, looks uh, for different information, also contradictory ones, and uh, tries to find information that can impact his or her judgment, and looks for the sources of uh, the perspectives and approaches of co participants. And uh, they also assess everything from a distance. Now, it seems very obvious. Uh, 
um, th that's the second competency, analyses. They solve problems uh, by systematic uh, research and examination of uh, situations. They ask uh, questions. Uh, they think logically. And they provide clear and easily understandable explanations. Another skill on this list is uh, the skill of hearing. Uh, they establish interpersonal relations and they listen carefully to their interlocutor. So it's a very precise list um, of how that person should behave, what they should be paying attention to. 69 elements constitute uh, the desired competency profile of a judge. Some of these uh, elements uh, can be developed during the education process, but not all of them. I hope that you can uh, see this table. Let's look at the last column. In this column, uh, those uh, competency groups that can be developed during the educational process have been marked. So social awareness, so self-reflection, self-awareness, Look at these uh, interesting points, uh, self-awareness, uh, self-reflection. Does anyone take this into account in the Polish system? Cooperation and working together, um, the uh, power of uh, being convincing, a uh, capacity for change, uh, flexibility, stability, determination, uh, being capable of formulating clear statements, uh, communication skills, uh, interpersonal skills. Now, these skills cannot be developed during the education process. This system believes that if we do not find the skills at the outset, it is practically impossible to instill those competencies into the candidates. So they are looking for candidates who are already predisposed to perform the function of a judge. And they're also looking for people who are capable of change. That's what the selection process focuses on. Whether this candidate is stable, they can uh, keep to uh, their opinions, are they immune to influence, but at the same time, are, are they capable of self-reflection, of critical thinking, of analyzing their position and their beliefs? All of this is assessed during uh, the recruitment process. And in these columns, uh, we uh, have a list of the methods which are used in the selection process. And these methods uh, are evidence-based. They are backed by science. There is um, an, an IQ test, a test of intellectual skills, so critical thinking, analytical thinking, those are the elements that are tested. A personality test, interview with a psychologist, uh, a moral dilemma test, a role play a test, and also performance under time pressure. So they want to check uh, what these candidates focus on when it's um, difficult to allocate a lot of time to all of them. So what they give priority to under pressure of time. This assessment uh, is uh, performed by the National Committee for Judge Selection, so LSR, but they also use the support of an external company, an external company which specializes in analyzing competency profiles of candidates uh, for jobs in different uh, branches of uh, the economy and different public institutions. And they also uh, work together with the local courts where the candidate wants to work. There are five stages of the recruitment process. And uh, this process is aimed at creating a short list of candidates. And at uh, the end, we have a candidate who has uh, the intellectual potential, the intellectual capacity to be a good judge. This candidate has been approved by the LSR, by the committee which is central to this process, and also a candidate who has been approved by the local, the target court. And what's interesting, the local selection committee is composed of not just of the judge, but also a representative of the court staff, uh, the head of the secretariat, so the person who will be working with uh, that judge on a daily basis.
basis. At first, of course, that judge will be an assistant judge because the procedure is uh, that uh, the candidate first becomes an assistant judge, then and only after they serve a trial period, they can be appointed as a, a judge. And they are not nominated for life. And the, um, the apprenticeship period depends on the experience and skills of that so people. If somebody is more experienced, uh, then the apprenticeship uh, can only take a couple of months. In other cases, it can take a couple of years. And I think that is a very reasonable process because even an experienced lawyer might not turn out to be a good judge. And I think this will be an interesting point for discussion. In the Netherlands, uh, to apply uh, for the position of an assistant judge, you need to have out-of-court experience. It is not possible uh, for someone to graduate from a legal faculty and work only at the court and apply to be a judge. They need experience um, in some other legal institution, in, in law office or somewhere else. So they need some experience from outside of the court. In this procedure, also the interpersonal social relations of the candidate are analyzed. So it is checked whether the candidate is capable of adopting the perspective of an average citizen. The candidates are inquired about their hobbies, about any social activities that they engage in, any social causes that they pursue. They want to check that their interests are not limited to, for example, penal law. And uh, these uh, judges also work in different departments of courts, uh, administrative, civil, uh, special departments of first instance uh, uh, courts. But uh, the system is a bit different uh, at courts of the first instance. Uh, in, in, the, in, in Poland, we only admit judges who already have experience. And the judges uh, in the Netherlands are rotating judges. They need to specialize in at least two fields of law. So they uh, switch between two different departments um, because the court needs, so to say, fresh blood. And this uh, directly impacts the functioning of courts. One of the elements of the Dutch judicial culture that we observed, so this requirement for self-reflection, for self-assessment, are necessary to ensure smooth cooperation between the judges of a court, uh, between courts, uh, consultations, um, seeking advice, looking for solutions together is a standard procedure in Dutch uh, courts. Also, it's uh, normal uh, for judges to give each other feedback on how they heard a case. And judges meet at uh, Dutch courts to discuss what uh, happened at the court uh, to give each other feedback, because they're responsible for how the court will function in the future. Because as I've said, uh, the judiciary is uh, independent. I think that's an interesting example for you, an intriguing one as well. I think it's um, very useful to Poland because the discussion on judge selection in Poland is pending, though it focuses mainly on procedural issues. Still, the Polish Judicial Council has arrived at the conclusion that they need to objectivize uh, the criteria listed in uh, the law. And it has uh, created a list of recommendations that it submitted to the uh, National uh, Judiciary Council uh, to look into. And I think it's uh, an interesting thing to highlight uh, that we have been using science and scientific evidence to outline the competencies we need in judges. So I think that will be interesting for you to read in the report. 
and I'm sure that you will receive a lot more information from Mr. Bart van Meegen, president of one of the courts in the Netherlands and also president of the National Committee for Judge Selection. So the body which decides who will become a judge in the future. And you will get some uh, interesting information uh, from our other guests who will be uh, introduced by Mr. Bourdje, uh, president of the management board of the foundation, to whom I now give the floor. Now we will be switching to English. I'm sorry, I can't I can't hear the moderator well because he's not using the microphone. But I think it's instructions for finding and using the headsets. The second panel will be entirely in English. It will be translated, but if you need a translation, make sure you get one before we, we start. Uh, my name is Stanislav Burdze, I will introduce and actually our panel was introduced already. Uh, we are really fortunate to have three excellent speakers uh, that will be able to tell us more about the details of the judicial selection processes in three different countries, starting with the Netherlands, and I will be inviting Bart van Meegen to, to join us on the stage. Bart, please uh, clap your hands. <laughs> Bart van Meegen is, as uh, was already explained, is the uh, chairman of the LSR Commission. So he's uh, uniquely positioned to tell us much more about the Dutch system of judicial selection. Although the LSR is just one, uh, one um, step in this whole process, he will be very knowledgeable to tell us about interviewing judges and uh, the competencies sought in Dutch judges. Uh, Bart is also the president of court in uh, the district of Overijssel in the northeastern part of the Netherlands. Uh, he used to be a practicing lawyer in Amsterdam and Utrecht. Uh, our second speaker will be Nazi Brola Janezashvili from Georgia. Nazi, please join us. And uh, Ms. Janezashvili has been uh, is currently the uh, chairman and founding member of a sister organization of Court Watch called the Georgian Court Watch. So we are very happy to, to host her and her wonderful team of uh, three other colleagues. Uh, they are with us today as well. Uh, Ms. Janezashvili used to be, uh, used to serve on the Supreme Council of Judiciary in Georgia between uh, 2017 and 2021, so one full term in the body that is more or less equivalent to our Polish uh, Council for the Judiciary. And uh, she's currently one of the leading advocates of judicial reform uh, in Georgia. And uh, our third speaker is uh, also former judge and the professor, uh, Mikhail Zernakov from Ukraine. Hello, Mikhailo. I don't know if you can see me. I can hear you, okay. It's great to have you. Uh, Mihaiwa is, uh, is a former administrative judge in the city of Vinica, uh, law professor uh, with multiple publications on legal issues, but also a uh, founding member of the uh, NGO called the Jura Foundation, who is one of the leading think tanks and advocate for the reforms of the Ukrainian judiciary. Mihaiwa is also uh, the chairman of uh, Public Integrity a commission that serves, to my understanding, uh, that serves the Supreme Council of Judiciary in Ukraine, exactly assisting the process of judicial selection. Welcome. All three speakers will first have uh, between seven and ten minutes to introduce in more detail uh, the their role in the judicial selection uh, processes in their countries. But why, why we invited these three people and these three countries as well? The idea, I think, is that uh, we clearly have one, uh, one excellent example to learn from, uh, the, the, the Dutch example. It certainly offers a lot of insight and lessons to be drawn and somehow implemented. We also have countries that struggle more mm, with, with, uh, with a number of problems, but both Ukraine and Georgia are countries where there were significant reforms in the recent past. So we will be able to hear about 
what kind of reforms were implemented in Georgia and in Ukraine? And also, what were the effects of these reforms? And what remains to be, to be done? And also, there are lessons to be learned from these examples for Poland as well. Uh, let me start with Bart van Megen. Uh, we've just heard the, we've just heard a, a number of details about the about the judicial selection system in uh, in the Netherlands, and I think it's, it I think it may be quite surprising to our Polish audience that you you put so much emphasis on those supposedly extra legal aspects. So not only legal knowledge, actually, it's one of the mm -hmm. uh, least emphasized. It's so, sort of taken for granted in many ways, perhaps. So I'd like maybe to, s to start with, with a question. Why put so much focus on these softer skills, social skills, like listening, empathy, um, 60, 67 other competencies? <laughs> Why so much focus? Yeah. Well, of course, uh, legal skills uh, and legal knowledge is important. Um, but when I go through a case as a judge, you start with, uh, you know, you start preparing a hearing. Uh, what you, what's important then is that you can analyze a case. Uh, so you need analytical skills and you need uh, legal knowledge. Uh, but the next phase uh, is the hearing itself, the session. And then you need communication skills, soft skills, to be in a good contact with the both parties to understand what's happening, understand what's happening in society, what understand what, what's important uh, for the parties themselves, to understand which kind of problems they face. Uh, after the hearing, you have to give a verdict. So then it's about decisiveness. Uh, you have to be uh, strong enough, but also you have to be flexible enough to, to make a decision that's really handling about this case, these facts, and um, in general, it's important to collaborate with your colleagues. And um, for instance, case management is important. It's not only the, the case that's on your desk, but it also has something to do with uh, uh, which priority do you give to which case, and, um, and how do you deal with your colleagues. What kind of agreements or appointments do you make together with the other judges in your courthouse? So um, when you look to the process of a case, I hope you can understand that it's not only legal knowledge. It's important, but it's part of the, the work of a judge. Okay. Uh, to my understanding, uh, you have taken part in many interviews, uh, interviewing uh, candidates for, for, for the judicial profession. Mm -hmm. And when you when you do these kind of interviews and when you take part in these selection procedures, uh, you collaborate with people from outside of the judiciary. Could you tell us more about who are the other professionals that are that sit on these commissions and how can you uh, learn from each other? What is their uh, their sort of role in this whole uh, hearing in this whole interview, and how you probably collaborate? Is it easy easy collaboration? Uh, it's quite easy. <laughs> um, but they bring in another perspective. So uh, in one selection procedure, uh, a candidate sees six people, and that's three groups of two. And one of the two is a judge, and the other two is someone from another field. So it can be an attorney, it can be a prosecutor, they're quite close, but it can also be a mayor. So we have someone who's very much involved in uh, uh, well, being against uh, discrimination, um, we have someone who is um, uh, very much involved in uh, working against uh, child abuse. So uh, people come from different perspectives, and um, in every uh, session, when we speak to a candidate, we have a focus on other things, other competences. So uh, it can be in the first um, uh, interview that it's more about uh, your social awareness. The second interview can be more about what's your motivation to become a judge. What do you want to, what do you bring uh, when you become a judge? And uh, the third can, can be on other com competences like collaboration or uh, 
he said. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm, let's take the first example, social consciousness. We probably would all agree that it's good for, for a judge to have social consciousness, but how do we test for it? How do we find out whether a person has social cons consciousness or not? How would you approach, uh, how would you test a candidate on social consciousness, for example? Yeah, th that's a rather difficult question, but what we do is um, we ask for examples. Um, so, and we thought about what could be uh, the behavior of a candidate that we, uh, that if we see it, if it's told about, it's, um, it tells us something about the social, be uh, social consciousness. Um, so for example, we ask for a situation that he or her had to, uh, to, to take care of uh, the social backgrounds of a person and what he did and how he, he or she explored it. Um, and uh, so we we and uh, so we try to make it objective, because on forehand we think of situations that could be indicators of social awareness, and we ask for real experiences. So not a not a vague situation. If then I would know what did you do when you were in a situation um, when social awareness was important. Mm -hmm. uh, I should perhaps add uh, something that Bartos didn't mention previously. Uh, we had a chance at Courtwatch to visit uh, several of the institutions that we talk about in the Netherlands earlier this year, uh, courtesy to Dutch uh, Embassy in, in Warsaw. Thank you. And w we had a pleasure to visit your workplace at the, the LSR Commission in Utrecht, as well as the Council of Judiciary in, in The Hague. And one of the interesting facts that we learned about your the, the whole in selection process was that you rely quite heavily on these uh, psychological tests. And these tests include a dark side test. Would you be able to tell us a bit more about the, the test? Wh why? <laughs> what is dark side test? Well, I don't know what you exactly mean okay. by dark side uh -huh. test. But uh, we were explained that there is a test mm -hmm. that is supposed to detect any pathological s aspects of personality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's, um, that's the work of the psychologists. So it's rather difficult for me, being a, uh, being a judge, to explain it. But it's an assessment, and it's not, um, they're not assessed on being in a courtroom. They're uh, assessed in a difficult situation as a professional, but can be in other profession. So it's, and, and then it's how you behave in difficult situations. So you can see if st someone is strong enough and flexible enough. And uh, what are you doing when you're in a, in a difficult situation, a difficult professional situation, that kind of thing. And it's the psychologist who gives the advice if someone is good or not, not good enough. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. So you rely and cooperate with psychologists. Yeah, we do. Mm. Could you think of a question that is really difficult for the candidates? Like when you talk to them, is there mm -hmm. a question that you can think of that is really the most challenging for them? Uh, well, it's um, another part, it's an assessment center, another part is about your personality. So you fill in all kinds of questions about your personality. And um, what they try, you get questions in different ways. So what they try is not that you <coughs> cannot make the tests uh, very positively what you think the best answer would be. So uh, there's also a check uh, if it's a real and honest answer. I think that's difficult in a selection procedure to be honest so and to have the right question. So that's why we go back to real experiences and not the what if question. Okay. It's that from, from our perspective. All right. Yeah. And I was thinking about one more question in this round. Do you think your system works? Uh, we, we have been presenting it as a system that mm -hmm. is near perfect, mm -hmm. to be copied, maybe followed. Uh, how, maybe this is, this is an accurate, uh, accurate assessment. How, how would you evaluate the system that you have? What are the strong, uh, strong sides uh, and maybe any, any, any problems with the system? Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think this method of selecting helps us. Um, uh, I, I think and believe that giving feedback to one judge to the other can improve. Um, but I'm not saying that we do it enough. 
but uh, we have to learn and we have to pay attention to it every time. So we have an in, uh, some kind of intervision, we, we give feedback, but we don't do it often enough. So it's also we that have to learn, and uh, it's very interesting for me to be here with you as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Let's uh, leave it uh, here for, for the moment, and I'll uh, turn uh, to our uh, second speaker, uh, Ms. Janice Ashvili. We would like to, to learn more about uh, the, the, the current Georgian experience with reforming the judicial selection process. Uh, we know that there has been f at least four different reform attempts or four different reforms implemented over the recent years. Uh, could you could you give us an idea about what what was what changed uh, because of these reforms, and what's the, the current situation? Did they work? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for uh, this um, introduction about me. Uh, so, <coughs> uh, I would like to uh, talk about the reforms uh, very briefly in Georgia. What was done after two thousand twelve. Uh, in 2012, in Georgia, we had the parliamentary elections. Uh, after that, uh, the new government decided to change the composition of the Judicial Council in Georgia. So many years ago, we had, for instance, uh, judges uh, in the uh, Judicial Council, members of the parliament, sometimes prosecutor, minister of justice. So there was a different kind of compositions uh, um, around uh, 12, uh, 2012 years before. Uh, so new, new government decided to change the composition and the uh, non-judge member institution was introduced in the Judicial Council. So it means that uh, currently we have uh, 15 members in the Judicial Council, uh, nine judge members, uh, uh, most of them are elected by the Conference of Judges. One is only ex officio member, Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice. And six members are nine judge members. It means that we have five uh, uh, nine judge members elected by the parliament, like me, uh, when I was there, and one is appointed by the president. So why I'm talking about these uh, details? Because uh, Judicial Council is the uh, most powerful body in Georgian judicial system. Uh, and Judicial Council decides the appointment, selection, nomination, promotion, about disciplinary liabilities, everything about judges. So uh, as regards to the selection of the uh, judges in Georgia and reforms uh, together, we can discuss about both issues. Um, uh, new government decided that we should have the um, uh, probation period of the judges who are uh, appointed first time. So we have experienced judges who have, um, for instance, more than three years experience. They can be appointed for lifetime or 10 years if they have experience. So it, it is a different regulation if you are an uh, experienced judge. But you are, if you are uh, electing and appointing first time in the judicial system, you should be in probation period. It means that uh, during the three years, um, uh, judges are evaluated by the Judicial Council every year. So one non-judge member and judge member are evaluating one uh, uh, judge who is in probation period. But uh, after three years, almost everyone is appointed on the position for lifetime. So we call it lifetime in Georgia, but it is, uh, it is not real lifetime appointment. It is uh, until the retirement age, which is uh, 65 years old, for both um, uh, women and men. So uh, as regards to the appointment, uh, it is necessary that 10 uh, Judicial Council members should support uh, the judge to become uh, the uh, judge and to be appointed as a position. So it means that nine, nine judge member plus one nine judge member is enough to be appointed as a position. So there is a big discussion in Georgia currently about this um, uh, procedure because we have some complications about it because other, uh, let's say, five nine judge members are not participating in the process. So we, uh, when I was a member of the High Council of Justice, I could not have the influence on the process because my vote was never important. 
So it is a problem, of course. Well, it is important that everyone should be involved in the process. What I can say about it is that the Judicial Council is an issue which is defined by the Constitution of Georgia. So uh, membership in a secretary of the Judicial Council, head of the Supreme, Supreme uh, Judicial Council, everything is defined by the Constitution of Georgia, also by the organic law on common courts of Georgia. So both are um, important uh, for the uh, legitimacy of the Judicial Council. After four uh, reforms in Georgia, we call it uh, four wave judicial reforms, which was introduced first time by the Ministry of Justice and by the Parliament in Georgia. Uh, we had very, uh, uh, maybe I can, maybe productive, maybe um, successful legislation amendments, but it was not implemented successfully. It is important in our case. So we have very nice legislation maybe. There is some problems of course and we can discuss about it, but it is not our issue today. But uh, generally there was introdu introduced were new regulations which could be effect uh, on the judicial independence, uh, uh, independence of the judges individually, also inst institution, but unfortunately the implementation of the legislation was not successful. Therefore, uh, we have a big discussion in Georgia about judicial independence, uh, also about effectiveness, you know, every issues about liabilities of the judges, every issues are very, very uh, big uh, problems in Georgia currently. Okay, why, why is this problematic? So yeah. it, it would <laughs> seem that you have a, quite a nice system with a lot of judicial independence when all the issues regarding the functioning of the judiciary, disciplinary issues, promotion, nomination, selection, it's all decided by the judges. So no I political influence. Sounds like a great uh, No, great we system. have a political influence, unfortunately. How, how, how this political yeah. influence is uh, you know, materialized? You know, uh, when uh, there was elections in 2012, uh, we had uh, judges who we are not appointed for a lifetime. Everyone was appointed for 10 years. The new government decided to give them possibility to be reappointed for a lifetime. So there started negotiation between the some group of the judges who had the high positions in the judiciary and uh, maybe influences, I can say, and this group of judges and the new government leaders had negotiation each other. Finally, what happened, they negotiated, unfortunately, and currently we have problem about the separation of power in, in Georgia because we see that the judiciary, sometimes not uh, on every case, but if there is a political case, high rate uh, issues, I don't know, there is a uh, uh, reason, uh, reasonable, maybe, let's say, case, sensitive cases, maybe, they can negotiate. This is our problem. And uh, because, uh, so uh, to answer correct, uh, more clear on your question, that our problem is the uh, political influence in the judiciary and not only political influence, uh, internal influence on the judges. So it means that outside from the political government, inside from the influential group of judges, the other judges, majority of judges, I think uh, they are under the risk because their independence um, uh, is very, very low level. They are maybe fighting, some of them, not everyone, but they are sometimes fighting, trying to be independent, uh, doing everything. But, uh, you know, when I started my talking, I mentioned that the Judicial Council in Georgia is the most powerful body. So uh, even if, for instance, uh, the judges will start speaking about any problems openly, or for instance, if they will vote uh, other person on the conference, which is not uh, maybe uh, 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 approved by the group of judges who has an influence, so it means that they should be disciplinary, uh, uh, maybe, I don't know, sanctioned. Uh, by the Judicial Council. It is a big risk in Georgia. And another problem that we have now, I can mention about it, it is a um, high rate, high number of the cases. So it means that the judges are very busy in Georgia. So if you were, we have a very clear uh, uh, you know, deadlines uh, to uh, uh, discuss and to uh, finish the case. So uh, in civil cases, for instance, it is very important to protect the deadlines by the judges, but all times they are violating the deadlines. So it means that any time judicial counsel can start disciplinary proceedings against the, any judge who works on the civil cases. Because they are, they are now vulnerable, I think so. They have a big uh, maybe problems because of this uh, problem. 
so we have now in Georgia around 350 judges, and we have 100 vacancies. So it means that the, uh, it is another problem. Our system is very closed. For instance, we had the meeting in Toron with the judge who told us that after the gradu graduation, you know, the law faculty, she had the possibility to study, to pass the exams, to become the judge. In Georgia, it is really difficult. You need to have a, um, uh, uh, to be a, for instance, staff member in the court or to have a good contacts in the judiciary. It is really difficult. And why we have 100 vacancies? Because it is a closed or outside for ordinary lawyers who are practicing in the court, so prosecutors maybe, I don't know anyone, anyone who has a um, qualification uh, appropriate to the judicial candidate. So it is a big problem in Georgia that the system is closed, therefore other judges, because we have a low number of judges in Georgia, if you concur with the cases, they are under the li uh, risk of the disciplinary liabilities, and so therefore their independence, you know, everything is under the uh, risk. I see that uh, you've been mainly talking about the procedure. So it's a bit slightly different topic because I, I think uh, from, from what Bart was um, saying, because Bart, more, you, you focus more on the qualities of the judge, on different ways to ensure that the candidates have these features that we desire. And uh, Nasi, you've been talking mostly about the composition of the council and its competencies and uh, the, the not so much about the who who are the judges? I understand yeah. you partly explained because the judges are recruited from a very close circle. So it's not really the priority to have certain type of people with certain type of skills, yeah. right? Uh, do um, you pay any attention uh, sure. to, to the uh, skills, uh, like soft, softer course. skills, communication issues? Uh, so when uh, when I was a member of the high, high Council of Justice, I participated maybe around maybe more than 200 interviews. Uh, with the judicial candidates. So it is really difficult, really hard. We spent, if I mm, talk about the process, we spent around uh, we spent around 20 minutes with each candidate to have an interview. But if the person was a uh, candidate of the Supreme Court uh, to be nominated to the Parliament of Georgia for the election as a, on the position, we spend around two hours with the candidate. So it is more complicated process if you are a judicial candidate for the Supreme Court of Georgia. We have one Supreme Court in our country. So uh, as regards to the um, s s selection process, uh, I, made the, I made the statistical information several times. And when I uh, saw the picture, uh, after 2012, when we had the changes in the government, in the political changes, only four practicing lawyers became the judge. Around four prosecutors, no, it is a really, really small amount of the um, lawyers because we have a bar in Georgia, bar association. We have a lot of lawyers practicing in the courts. You know, they have a, a lot of skills um, to be uh, to become the judge. It is absolutely enough. Sometimes it depends on particular uh, lawyers, but then generally it is very important that the lawyers should become the judges. But unfortunately, it is not practice in Georgia. It is really closed system. And when I saw the um, statistical information, mostly um, staff of the courts are becoming the judge. But it depends. It depends because if you are working with the judge who has um, more influences, you have uh, more possibilities to become the judge. And we have such examples. But even the, there are some examples when the person passed judicial exam, uh, was working as, as an assistant of the judge for 15 years, but she was not appointed on the position. She tried several times, but was refused. Therefore, it is a problem, of course, because the system has a kind of selective policy to appoint the judges on the position, so it is uh, important. But the, the selectiveness, uh, is it enshrined in the law? Does it require somebody to have a like a professional connection to the court? Or is it something that no. happens in practice? So theoretically, uh, the uh, other candidates, like lawyers, could uh, compete, but they will just not have a chance in practice. Yeah, uh, this is uh, interesting uh, that uh, it is not required by the law. In our legislation, we have a very nicely uh, defined that the judges, judicial candidates, should be competent qualification. There is a criteria of the qualifications, should have a degree in law, experience as a lawyer. There are some particular issues. 
And also, there is another article in the organic law and common courts of Georgia that the judge, judges should have the integrity. So integrity mm, means uh, several um, sub-criteria. We have around more than 20 sub-criteria about integrity. It is about independence, uh, personal abilities, you know, uh, many, many issues we, are, uh, we have in the uh, uh, organic law, but unfortunately, you know, we have an evaluation form also when we have interview with the judges, we have a particular um, uh, deadline to complete the evaluation form. Uh, in the competence, there is a scores, for instance, um, uh, legal, I don't know, abilities about the legal uh, issues, um, about, for instance, uh, experience as a professor or a teacher or something like that. So there's a different criteria about qualification and about integrity. We have a three uh, evaluation criteria. First one is a person satisfies the integrity criteria, uh, then uh, fully satisfies and doesn't satisfy. So you should just check it. So it is really uh, easy, you know. You don't need any justification. You can just check. Person uh, is a fully uh, uh, fully satisfies the integrity criteria or not. So nobody is requesting um, any justification about it. Even my, me, when I was uh, evaluating them, I had the organic law on the left side. You know, I reading the criteria, then um, uh, uh, making the evaluation. But uh, you know, you are very free. You can write anything, so nobody will, will request any uh, explanation about it. So it is, uh, of course, you know, negative, because mm -hmm. uh, the persons who has a high qualification, high integrity, can be uh, uh, restricted to the judges. Mm -hmm. well, that, that's a very good uh, bridge to our next speaker, Mihai Wo. Uh, we, we just heard that in Georgia, they do uh, take into account the integrity criterion, but as, a, as far as I could understand, there is no real way to, uh, to objectify it. So there is no measure, there is no tools that could help the, those, uh, the, those selecting judges to make more informed decisions. Uh, quite the opposite than in the Dutch case, where there is a significant amount uh, of tools, psychometric tests and, and experiments, uh, games, uh, and uh, a series of interviews with, with different sets of people. Uh, I know that you have been instrumental in inspiring some of the recent reforms of the judiciary in Ukraine, and that you also chair a commission that is specifically tasks, is tasked uh, with assessing the integ public integrity of the candidates. Could you please tell us more? How, how do you do it? And what does the, the, the body that you chair do? And how do, how do you do perform these kind of integrity checks? Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody, again. And first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Polish people and really the people of uh, the free world for all the support that you guys are providing for Ukraine in these dark times. Um, thank you very much. And we uh, please continue doing this. And we really, uh, because we really need your support and we really need more. Uh, support especially the arms in order to end this nightmare so thank you uh, again now uh, for the court system and for the public integrity council i used to chair the institution not anymore uh, the idea of the institution because just because our tenure uh, came to an end um, now we're, we're now in the middle of judicial reform and that's uh, i would not dig very much into the details but um, the idea of the public integrity council came from the understanding of the necessity of the public oversight of the process because in Ukraine the integrity of judges is uh, the main issue still right now and it was when the public integrity council was designed and we saw that uh, may sound like a, a an obvious thing but uh, uh, we should not call it it's a great exercise it's a great idea to learn from each other and I congratulate you on the event um, and I also learned already quite a bit uh, from the previous parts of it. But we, we should understand what we should not copy paste uh, things because we learned this the hard way because we wanted to uh, make judiciary at first since the revolution of dignity in 2013 14, we understood that judiciary is in a, not in a very good shape uh, to say the least, and we have to reform it and we have to make it more independent. And then we uh, basically copy-pasted from uh, the other European nations uh, the formula for uh, the self-governance of the judges, so to say. Um, and I say so to say because it didn't work quite well 
uh, quite as well in Ukraine because it's on one hand in in the countries where uh, there is trust to the judiciary when the judiciary acts as uh, you know uh, as an independent institution and does what it uh, or at least mainly does what it what it has to do uh, is one thing and uh, the judicial self governance I think is a good way to preserve the system first of all when the you know the reputable judges select the best uh, or the most reputable judges and then they the most knowledgeable whatever it is and then they select the next generation and it makes sense in ukraine when the level of trust to the judiciary is about 10 percent it oscillates around this number for the last eight um years so you can imagine because people cite corruption and dependence on politicians and oligarchs as main two reasons for the mistrust uh, you can understand that basically the bad system would, would it, if we introduce the self-governance, the bad system just reproduces itself. And that is why we uh, decided to introduce the um, another element. Basically what, what happened is that uh, the judges that were selected to the High Qualification Commission of Judges, it's a separate body that selects judges, and the High Council of Justice, they both had majority of judges, but of course they did not want to uh, say to sanction or to uh, be very critical to their fellow judges because it's their, you know, um, colleagues, their relatives, sometimes their close people. So somehow did not work that they were very, you know, reluctant to dismiss them or to uh, discipline them uh, or whatever. That is why the previous attempts at judicial reforms failed. So that is why we uh, decided to introduce an element that would be critical enough towards the judges and uh, basically, that would be thorough enough in the assessment of judicial integrity because, just to give you an idea, uh, one of the uh, exercises that was the competition to the new Supreme Court that we decided to uh, make from scratch because uh, of how bad the system was uh, on the new, uh, supposedly new competitive selection uh, basis. And uh, while doing that, uh, the judge comes to an interview and she's asked, uh, and we then, then at the Public Integrity Council, we found that uh, she had um, a house, uh, or she and her family had a house about 400 square meters and five apartments downtown Kyiv and several land plots around Kyiv. So it's a, it's a lot of property that sh she has not earned uh, during her professional life because we also see all the income that she uh, received. And when she was asked where, where, where's all the stuff from? She responds, uh, well, I, I used to go, as a student, I used to go to German Democratic Republic, so East Germany, and uh, work as a stoker, and also as picked up berries, and then I got some Deutsche Mark, I brought them back, and, and then I bought all this property. And that, um, believe it or not, that satisfied uh, her fellow judges who were in the commission, and they said, okay, there's no, there's no problem here, she can, she can continue serving as a judge, even though she didn't make the final cut to the Supreme Court, but other people with similar uh, background did. So the idea was to uh, introduce this uh, non-judicial, 100% uh, civil society body, but that would be official uh, to uh, basically uh, has 20 members that are selected, that are attorneys, journalists, human rights defenders, uh, and I'm always forgetting the, the fourth one, um, basically all the people who can um, be thorough in analyzing judicial integrity, um, make, who have experience in making you know, journalist investigations, who have experience in civil society and whatnot, but who would be professional enough to bring this before the commission and say, to basically act as a sort of uh, public uh, prosecutor in terms of uh, integrity and um, bring it before the commission. And then of course, the, at the public hearing, the judges could um, explain certain things, and if, if the explanation was satisfactory, uh, the idea was at least that, that they can go through, um, and then if it's not, then the commission would uh, basically ban them, or uh, uh, depending on, uh, on the procedure, whether it is a competition or it, it is a disqualification assessment. But uh, unfortunately, the Public Integrity Council did not have uh, any power, uh, any administrative power to make the decisions on their own, and uh, even though we analyzed about 3,000 judges and uh, uh, issued uh, decisions on hundreds of them uh, on the incompatibility with the integrity criteria, 
uh, only a few of them were uh, sacked by the commission because in the end it was it were the commissions that um, consisted of judges and other legal professionals um, that made the final decision and basically overruled the majority of our uh, findings. But what, uh, so we basically, we did not become the, say, the guillotine that, that chopped off the head of judicial corruption, but at least we became the mirror for uh, how, for what is the real state of the judiciary and how the processes of judicial selection, uh, appointment and uh, assessment are going. And they turn out to be, uh, we collected a lot of evidence that turned out to be not going very well. That is why we're now going, uh, we're having another iteration of judicial reform, which is aimed at re rebooting the whole, these uh, judicial authorities, the, the High Qualification Commission and the High Council of Justice, um, who are responsible uh, for the selection of judges and for disciplining of judges mainly. And uh, basically we learned from this experience a lot and now we are um, in the middle of the exercise of basically filling these institutions with the trust for the members who would then take on a mission of uh, cleansing the judiciary, uh, which is already now we have a, we have a, a similar proportion to, to the one in Georgia. We, we, ha we have about 7,000 positions and about 2,500 vacancies right now. So we already, uh, by different means, we cleansed quite a bit, but we have to finish this exercise. And then uh, as soon as these uh, institutions are established, We'll have to we'll give them a very big exercise at, at uh, hiring this big number of judges. That is why the stakes are very high now uh, in Ukraine, and uh, what is what is happening now will define pretty much how Ukraine's judiciary will look like in the next I don't know twenty or thirty years. And I'll stop uh, here. Thank you. Thank you very much for this ex extensive discussion. I wanted to double check. I understood one one particular issue uh, correctly. I understood that you said. Uh, the commission that you used to chair was not, after all, uh, that effective because it didn't have enough decision power, right? So it did not have the power to make um, uh, make decisions that will affect the the outcome of the selection. But uh, you seem to be saying that there is, there is a reform underway, and you seemed quite confident that it's going to to be effective. That, so uh, am I getting it right that there is a reform underway? that will give more power to the integrity commission that you were talking about, that offer ho offers hope that things will get better in the near future. Is this correct? Basically, yes. I Sorry, I didn't want to make this even more extensive to, to give uh, even more details. Uh, yes, we did not uh, have a have separate um, decision-making power in order to make decisions that would affect judicial career. But if we had uh, in the integrity council, if we had a negative opinion on judicial integrity, then we, uh, the law required two thirds of the qualification commission of judges to overrule this decision. So basically, it, it, even though it did not have direct consequences, it, it, it uh, had some consequences to the procedure and not all the judges passed that filter, but the majority, the vast majority did. So in the end, it all boiled down to how, to the quality of the commission itself, uh, and uh, it turned out to be also unsatisfactory. That is why we're now rebooting the commission. So we're basically taking steps and steps in order to say, okay, let's, um, basically we designed the reform, first attempts of reforms were very modest, uh, but the more we kind of try to bite off this uh, corrupt system, the more we understand that uh, we have to do more and more and now we basically came to the highest uh, two highest bodies the high qualification commission and, and the high council of just council of justice uh, which is the constitutional body and we're rebooting both of them at this moment uh, under different rules uh, including uh, by the way the independent international experts who we invited to uh, basically sit on the commissions who select or the commissions that select the uh, these two, the members of these two institutions, because we understood that we have to borrow uh, basically the good practices and uh, the expertise from uh, those um, countries where the practices of analyzing judicial integrity are well established and where the members are, you know, reputable and uh, uh, we can be sure that their judgment is fair and uh, yields uh, good results. And that is why we are now. Um, I can't say convinced, but we are very hopeful that uh, this exercise will bring um, good results because we're basically 
effectively rebooting two most important institutions. Okay, well, when you say, uh, what, what, would you be able to tell us what are these countries that were effective in establishing mechanisms for uh, integrity checks? That's, that's a good one because uh, we have to differentiate because uh, between the mechanisms for integrity checks and basically the judgment of the members because uh, um, despite the uh, relative uh, or, or, or quite poor results, let's be honest, of the pre previous attempts at judicial reform in Ukraine at, at rebooting it and basically cleansing the, the judiciary, we had a good counterexample is this establishment of the high anti-corruption court that, that's a part, of course it's a part of the, of the uh, judicial system, but it's a, a little separate because it's the only court where we applied this new rule, basically inviting the independent international experts. And these were, um, one was the former member, it was a panel of six people. One is a former member of uh, the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, and there are judges from uh, Denmark, Canada, USA, um, no, not USA, I think, sorry. Um, uh, the UK, um, Lithuania, and uh, did, I, did I already count six or five? So basically the EU countries, the uh, different legal systems, but what was important is not really the procedures, which are important, and we also had a psychological test and all that, but what uh, uh, was more important, I think, is the judgment on judicial integrity, it's where there would be people who would say, look at, at, at the case and uh, not and, and make make a fair judgment if, if there's something wrong with the people with, with the judges uh, income or their property or their prior decisions and that would be thorough and that would make the decisions to uh, not let them go through because that was whatever basically whatever was the um, background of a judge it was very politically influenced and their um, their judicial bodies uh, their their, their partners and their colleagues in the High Qualification Commission of Judges basically let almost everybody through, which was uh, which was a very bad example. So, so what mattered to us is that with these uh, foreign judges, these international experts would come and say uh, that they were judges mostly and some prosecutors that would come and say and make a final judgment on uh, uh, judicial integrity and say basically say to to those people who don't correspond to integrity criteria, sorry, on this time. Mm -hmm. Will these international experts have the final say? So uh, uh, it seems like it's a pretty radical uh, solution to, to hand the ultimate decision to nominate someone a judge in Ukraine to yes. a set yes. of international yes. experts. Yes no. Will yes they have no. a definitive they, they just, say? They acted as a filter. Uh, so they um, basically, their goal was to not let through the bad candidates. Uh, who do not correspond to the integrity criteria, but then uh, all the finalists that went through that, that of course, uh, first like the final decision was made by the High Qualification Commission of Judges, and then uh, formally the president appointed them uh, to be uh, judges. So um, we, we had a lot of discussions on sovereignty and all that, and of course it may sound as, as a kind of um, exotic uh, measure, but we, believe me, we tried many things. So we tried uh, political appointment, didn't work um, because the, you know, in the previous regime, they, they, we have similar problems that Georgia has. You know, our politicians wanted to subdue and uh, were quite successful in subduing the judiciary and so on. So, so political appointment is out of, of question. We tried judicial self-governance, doesn't work either. So it's, there was not much left uh, to, I will try the civil society, but of course, uh, it did not have, it was successful in terms of we did our job, it's, it's not modest, but uh, we did, we, I think we did our job quite uh, all right and we quite well, and uh, I sent three reports uh, on that uh, to uh, uh, to the colleagues uh, via email, so if you're interested, um, uh, you, you can have access to them, they're, they're, they're described in, in great detail how it went, uh, so we in the end arrived where we understood that we have to have somebody who is professional enough, and who can make uh, judgments, but who will not be influenced by the um, our politicians and uh, oligarchs and others who want to influence the system, but who at the same time would uh, also cannot be under undermined saying, oh, you know, the civil society, what do they want, and so on. So it's, it seems that the com this combination of things 
that uh, uh, the, the international members had, the international experts had. It was uh, it was very good for uh, this role, and they they made an excellent job. And basically, now we have the anti-corruption court that uh, not a single uh, judge with severe reservations from uh, the civil society about them, their integrity, or about their uh, you know uh, uh, prior decisions, uh, their property, whatnot. Um, made it through uh, to the final composition of the court, which uh, we think is an outstanding result. And already for three years, the anti-corruption court is uh, uh, working and, and uh, uh, yielding good results. Uh, there is already dozens of people of high-profile uh, uh, corruptioners are in jail. And uh, now we're scaling this system basically uh, to the rest of the uh, judiciary, introducing also this element of the independent international experts in uh, rebooting the judicial governance bodies. Uh, thank you very much. I, I certainly would have a lot of questions uh, right away, but I don't want to monopolize entirely the discussion. And uh, I, was, I was wondering whether, we, whether any of you would like to ask a quick question to each other to better understand or maybe add something after what we've heard? Any ideas or shall I just uh, start with a second round of questions? Yeah, okay. Uh, maybe in the same order, the, again, I'd like to better understand the, the details. Uh, we are fortunate to have you, and we can delve deeper into, into each of your country's uh, solutions and also problems. And Bart, I wanted to understand, uh, to, to ask you, are you getting enough candidates? We've heard about vacancies in Georgia. We've heard about vacancies in Ukraine. But I'm aware that there, there also are some vacancies in the Dutch system. And it's, it, it, from what I have heard during this study visit is that courts in the Netherlands are actually advertising actively to promote themselves as workplaces. It's, it's not like they run advertisements in, in TV, but they try to sound like a nice place to work in. Uh, candidates are, in, we were told, uh, candidates are invited to give a call to the head of the court, maybe, maybe fix an appointment and have, have coffee, to, to understand better if they have any chance or if they are the right candidates, like a primarily assessment. So again, my question, vacancies and ways to fill them. Um, well, we have some vacancies, but that's more uh, a planning problem. Because uh, I think about 10 years ago, we thought that we should have less cases. Indeed, we have less cases, but cases have become more difficult, so they take more time. And uh, so uh, it's more a planning problem. Um, if we have vacancies, it's uh, for the courts of first instance. It's rather, it's, it's, it goes rather well. We can fill them in all. Uh, in the courts of appeal, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, I think because the standards that we ask for someone being a judge in the court of appeal are higher, and uh, someone has to have a lot of experience being a professor, for example. So uh, the risks he, someone takes not coming to the procedure are also higher. So it, it, it's, um, I don't know exactly, but it's more difficult to fill in the, uh, the vacancies we have in the, the courts of uh, second instance. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, yes, we do some promotion. Um, and we uh, invite people to, to, to call us and to, to, to come for a talk to in orientation. Yeah, that's what we do. And sometimes we ask people to come for a talk to uh, which we think that should be good uh, judges in future. So, and we're working on a, well, uh, how do you call it? A, a mark as an, as an employer. So, mm -hmm. Um, so it's that people see that it's good to be a judge or working at the district court because you, um, I think a lot of people need, uh, well, a, a fair society and, 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 and like to work in, a, in an institution that works in a fair society. So that's the way we like to promote ourselves and uh, to, to to be to be an interesting place mm -hmm. to work as a judge, but also as a clerk or as a well something else. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've heard that th this this uh, an working environment, friendly working environment, is one of the uh, uh, attractive features uh, that at that attracts 
uh, candidates yeah. that in many ways, especially uh, at the uh, second, le second instance level, uh, these candidates have a lot of alternative opportunities. They could make be making a lot of money in tax law or, or uh, in co corporate uh, law, but they are still uh, come to, to courts. Why? Because th I think because they'd like to contribute to a better society. And um, working at a tax firm, you work to get better, uh, well, uh, uh, better, more money for the companies you work for. But uh, people becoming a judge have two reasons, working for a better society, and it's really legal work. You don't have to advertise yourself as an attorney or as a, as a firm. Uh, no, the work comes up to us, and it's legal work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Um, I wanted also to ask one more question. Are you aware of any countries in the world that were looking and maybe tried to implement or borrow or, or, or successfully implemented any of the Dutch solutions? Are you aware of such efforts or inspirations? Um, well, I'm aware that we, uh, that from Spain there is also uh, interest, but other, but the interest is from uh, uh, from people who make a, a movie, a documentary, mm -hmm. uh, uh, about their system, and they're critical about the system. So it's it's uh, uh, other people okay. than the judiciary itself, uh, and they came to us. And uh, this this autumn there will be some kind of documentary or something uh, about what we do to inspire the Spanish system. Mm -hmm. They have only a legal knowledge test exam to become uh, a judge or a trainee judge. Okay, thank you. And uh, basically, I would be asking the same question to you, Nazi, because uh, when you were implementing, implementing these reforms, are, were there any particular examples uh, that were you look you were looking at? Were you trying to implement some of the solutions from elsewhere, and how did it work? If if you did, or was it your own invention solution? Uh, oh, I I couldn't say exactly because. Um, Georgia has uh, cooperation with European countries with different uh, to introduce, introduce different experience in Georgia. But as far as I remember, uh, the institution of the Judicial Council, the new standard what I talked about, was uh, as an example of Spain, as far as I remember, and some kind of example also we took from France about the High School of Justice. So it depends on the particular issue. Maybe it is kind of, kind of composition of the different practices. So um, I would like to return back about the uh, vacancies. So you had the mm, first question the about it. And uh, I would like to give you some numbers. I have research which was prepared by our, our organization. So just this number is very interesting even for me. For instance, in 2000, uh, maybe 15, we had uh, 42 vacancies in the judiciary of judges. And we had 96 um, applicants. And only 10 uh, persons was appointed uh, on the position. But the number of applicants uh, was uh, decreased last year. So it means that, in unfortunately, because of the reputation of the judiciary, because of the uh, reputation of the profession, I don't know, but the number of the uh, uh, applicants for the judicial positions decreased. For instance, in 2020, we had uh, 99 vacancies, and there was only 67 um, uh, applicants. So it means that there is no competition. So anybody can become the judge in Georgia, but you know, there is no competition. The same situation was in 2021. For instance, we had uh, 85 vacancies, but only 56 candidates. So there was no competition also. So uh, even if, uh, if you are a member of the Judicial Council, you don't have a choice, so it is difficult, really. Uh, and uh, But the policy what is in our country and, and the government has in Georgia, there is no open policy. So to make the more uh, promotion of this position, you know, as a judge, uh, or I don't know, different kind of activities to conduct, there is no such uh, attitude in my country. And um, another problem is that what I talked already about it, that uh, the, the, it is in our research as well, and uh, so this uh, 
group of people who has a, uh, power now to appoint the judges, they are searching the candidates in their uh, society, circle maybe. So it is a problem, of course, and it uh, has very negative effect because you know when you see that there is not a Mm, uh, I don't know, uh, different professional backgrounds. You, you told when you started the, today's your speech, you told, talked about, not about only qualification of the judges also, their life experience, which is very important. But we see that the judges who became in Georgia, they don't have uh, appropriate life experience. Sometimes when the staff of the judicial system became the judge, it is important, of course, but if only staff of the ju judicial system became the staff, uh, judge, it is a problem. So they have a very good technical skills maybe, they know how the system works, they know even software, what the judicial system has, everything. They know structure of the courts and it is maybe easy for them to be integrated in the system. But also lawyers, uh, people from the academic sphere, I don't know, other professions, uh, is is very, very important to become the judges. But unfortunately, we don't have such kind of policy in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I'll now turn to, to Mihawa to, to f finish this uh, second round and then uh, we'll of course have questions from the audience. Uh, I, was, uh, I was wondering, Mihawa, whether these international experts, they are only involved in integrity checks or are they also taking part in, in uh, evaluating candidates for other criteria? Is their role reduced to integrity check? Or are they also involved in other, uh, in other as in evaluating other aspects? And my second question would be whether, you know, uh, there should be some te uh, technical problems uh, like language differences, right? You have uh, people from a lot of countries uh, attending, uh, per taking part in this procedure, and also will they understand your country well enough to be ordered to make meaningful decisions? These are some of the questions that come to my mind. Thank you. Uh, th these are all excellent questions, by the way. Uh, one, uh, very quickly, yes, uh, or no, depending on what was the question, no. Uh, what I'm trying to say is not that not limited solely to uh, integrity checks. There's also uh, professionalism, but um, it was mostly about integrity, uh, I should say, because they, uh, again, because of the reasons, also technical reasons, uh, when it comes to the assessment, uh, translation and all that, um, you could not, you know, analyze as much as, as the uh, Ukrainian members um, of the High Qualification Commission could. Uh, but because they were mostly about, they are mostly there to make judgments on integrity, sometimes there, there were these professionalism uh, issues raised, but they are also in connection to the integrity thing. So it's either, I don't know, I did not declare my, I don't know, 20 cars, and some of the judges made claims that, oh, I just forgot. So that means that uh, even though maybe you're not, uh, or we don't trust you, and it's still an integrity issue, or maybe we do trust you, but you're not diligent enough if you forget uh, time and time again to, um, you know, to declare your car and then your house and then something else. So it's, uh, it may be that they're really not diligent enough if they claim so, but there still cannot be a judge if they make this mistake over and over again uh, because uh, it's, well, it's a professionalism issue but still connected to integrity. Now, um, when it comes to translations and such, uh, at the previous panel we had uh, simultaneous translation interpretation. So it was at the interviews, it's, it's the same technology, so, so no, not much uh, different and uh, it worked well. And of course there was a secretary that translated all the documents uh, for during the exchange between the members of the international members of the panel and the judges, uh, because they, of course, they, in writing, they would ask questions before the interview to um, find out as much as possible before the interview commences. Uh, but um, of course, it, it, it would uh, make things more difficult, but it was still feasible, and uh, basically, there was. Um, there weren't any things lost in translations or, or poor judgment that, that are connected to uh, translation itself. What really was sometimes lacking is that the understanding of the local context. Basically, uh, why banning peaceful assemblies for the judges was an issue, well, the great issue for the Ukrainian people, for example, because especially 
um, oh, th that's a non-democracy tool essentially to use the judges to ban peaceful assemblies uh, generally, uh, especially in our uh, system. And uh, th the same decision that could happen, I don't know, in, in the Netherlands or in other established democracies may be not as uh, quote unquote bad for uh, and, and, and prove uh, service proof of, of the compliance with the integrity criteria um, as well as it did uh, in Ukraine, especially when we're talking about the um, uh, the events that transpired in late 2014, early 2000, late 13, early 14, during the revolution of dignity, when the judges were specifically used in order to ban peaceful assemblies uh, and to then throw people in jail that, who are innocent protesters and so on. So we had to explain the specificity. We had to. Um, engage with international members saying look at this this has this specific context and that is why we think a civil society it is not uh you know uh, the, the judge was clearly a subject to political influence and they did not raise any issues and they you know went uh with that serving as a tool basically for the politicians and uh, they knew they were breaching the law but still engaged in this decision making and that is why they're not corresponding to the integrity criteria but again uh, for most of the time uh, and I mean, the much vast, vast majority of the cases, we uh, find an agreement that we found ways to explain to the international members who, of course, again, are prominent judges, prominent prosecutors who can understand what the context is if, they, if they're given enough uh, context and information. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, I thank all three panelists for the second round, and it's time time to move the, the questions uh, from the audience. I can think of many lessons we could uh, draw from these three different systems. Uh, the, the Dutch system, which can take integrity for granted, essentially, but still has uh, a, a robust uh, checks and balances system with a lot of autonomy for the judges, but also some oversight if needed. Then we have the, the Georgian system, where judges have a lot of independence that is, I understand, sometimes being abused to close the, the, the recruitment into the profession. And we have the Ukrainian example where the final uh, stage of the reforms was to introduce civil society uh, or, or civil society and the international experts to ensure the, there is a real robust and working uh, system for uh, ensuring quality judges. So let's hear from, from, from our audience. Krzysztof Weicher, Netherlands Embassy in Warsaw, Political Department. Um, in the first place, uh, Bartosz, thank you very much for our cooperation. It's been a pleasure and a privilege. Uh, um, we're very proud uh, and happy. <laughs> Um, I only had a, a, a few moments just to go diagonally through the report uh, page by page and not uh, sentence by sentence. Uh, so maybe you, um, you do touch upon uh, um, the issue. But I think what is important to add uh, um, here is that um, the Dutch system, the Dutch judiciary system, the Dutch political system does not function in a vacuum. It's, it functions in a certain um, context, um, social context, historical context, political context. And one of the uh, characteristics of the uh, Dutch society is the very high level of trust within the society, uh, people versus people, but also people versus um, state institutions. Um, and, um, that means that everybody trusts, that everybody is um, acting in good faith. Um, and that is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Judge von Mechen, I know that it is has been deteriorating over the past years, but I, th I think still the Netherlands is one of the uh, examples in, in, in Europe of, of, of uh, societies with, uh, with a high uh, level of trust. And, and that's um, especially if, you, if, you, mm, if you're thinking about, uh, well, not copying uh, a system, but, but inspiring, making it, making it your inspiration, that, that is one of the bases of the, of the, of the Dutch society. Um, compromise, consensus, that, that's, that's, those are values that the, um, 
that the Dutch are attached to. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. We had one more question, uh, in the, at least one more. Judge. Thank you for this comment, although uh, we, I emphasize that it would be perfect if you could make a uh, succinct question and address it at a particular panelist. That would mm -hmm. be very helpful. Okay. My name is Marzana Korzonek. I'm a judge uh, from the court, uh, district court in Racibórz. Uh, I have uh, two questions uh, to Mr. Bot. Um, the first one is a specific uh, and practical question. Um, do you ask uh, the candidates uh, about the uh, private um, things, about the um, private life, about, uh, mm, for example, hobbies, uh, mm, books they, uh, they read, uh, and, for example, the films they watch, or um, the activity in uh, social media? Uh, is it in your area of interest? And the second uh, question is more difficult. Maybe not difficult for you, but for Polish judges, some of them. Uh, have you ever heard, for example, in media, in television, uh, about the um, judges in your country that, I don't know the word in English, for mm -hmm. casta, that you're some specific... That there is a uh, special case, a special very, um, privileged group a of uh, judges. Way, uh, the pejorative way, the casta group, Caste. a caste yes. group uh, of the... Mm, of the... of the all... Uh, mm, of the old society. Uh, f so, uh, have you heard um, about the judges in your country, uh, in media, in a negative way? Not particular case and particular um, sentence, but generally about the part of the judges. Thank you. Thank you. Well, your, your first question was if I ask to someone if what kind of books or movies or social media? Um, well, um, we're most uh, more we interested in activities in social society. So we ask if they, uh, what, if we ask for a hobby, it's not if they like gardening, but we like to know what they do in social uh, uh, society. So which kind of uh, community they are, they are in, what kind of role they play, if they're a chairman of a church or whatever, and that kind of thing. And, but it can also happen that you think, well, what kind of person is it? And then you'd like to, and when someone writes that he reads books, you ask, what, what's the best book? Uh, what would you recommend? So it can be part of, of, the, of, the, of the, the interviews. But that it, then it is to get to know the person as a person, uh, the candidate as a person. Um, so that's the first question. The second is, if there has some negative, has been some negative and negative negativism about judges in general uh, in Dutch media. Um, yes, I think um, uh, yes, and uh, most of the uh, that is about uh, judges being too active, but there's a difference between being active, I think that's good, and being uh, political in your decisions. So um, I think it's very good for a judge to be very active. That means that you really uh, are looking for, searching for proof that you are helping uh, the discussion in a hearing to, to see what, what you, to, well, what's really happening. So you have the all overview of a case, then you're an active judge and you are active in finding the right legal uh, uh, rules and the right um, uh, case law, for example, and a European example, so you're, that's active. And when the criticism is about judges, that's, um, that it's, that are too political. So, for example, the Urgenda 
uh, decision. I suppose you heard about it. It's about uh, if the government does takes enough measures to 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 reach the climate goals. And uh, from some right wing parties, there was criticism that it was too political and not the work of a judge. But the other hand is that the judges um, based it on European uh, law. So it was a legal decision. And uh, in, we see that in some difficult uh, issues, it's not so very easy to find a political answer nowadays. So that's about climate. That has to do something with some social uh, uh, problems. Uh, uh, for example, yes, I don't know what it is. Stickstoff? Uh, nitrate. Sorry? Nitrate. nitrate. Uh, so we have the farmer uh, uh, demonstrations in Holland. I suppose you heard about that. And um, the, there is not a good political answer, but a judge, when a case comes for, he must give an answer. He, he cannot shut down. So um, then we get in that position. But it's... I think the Dutch ju judges uh, are active, should be active, and I think we are not political active. But the criticism is about that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. <coughs> no, I think we have another question. Yes. Do pana sędziego naszego gościa z Niderlandów. I would like to welcome. I would like to like ask a question to our guest from the Kingdom of Netherlands. My name is Andrzej Kuba. I am a a judge, and I have been retired since for three weeks now. And I succeeded in reaching this high level of uh, decision-making at the courts thanks to a decision of the European uh, Court of Human Rights which uh, questioned the decision of the National Council for the du Judiciary which was supported by the President uh, of uh, Poland on retiring judges at the age of 67 years, even without the approval of the president. Uh, so, Andrzej Kuba, I am the subject of uh, that uh, case at uh, the European Court of Justice. So, that's um, just um, in terms of an introduction. Now, Coming to my question, on the 30th of August, I have uh, celebrated my 50-year jubilee of working in the judiciary. I worked uh, in times of the Polish People's Republic. These times have been mentioned here that uh, these judges uh, were not condemned, though they should be. I believe that I have not deserved to be condemned, because uh, in the 1980s, we came up with the first draft law on uh, uh, judge, uh, judicial self-government. And we performed that work in Krakow, but I won't uh, go into historical details, and I won't tell you about uh, the work on the National uh, Judiciary Council in the 1990s or uh, my experience in different public institutions. Let me, let me move on to the current situation in the National Council of the Judiciary. I don't have to tell our audiences about the ongoing situation because they're all following the developments. We know that uh, the National Judiciary Council has been devastated, and the Neo Council is uh, not uh, it is, is a very apt term uh, for uh, the current body that is functioning in Poland. Let me be frank. I was greatly inspired by uh, the system used in the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And I think that Mr. Timmermans and uh, the Kingdom of, Netherlands, of the Netherlands are very critical of the Polish uh, system and changes to that system. And Poland uh, deserves this criticism. And now I know why the Netherlands have such high confidence among their society 
such high confidence in the judicial system, because if that is what judge selection looks like, if that those are the criteria that are being applied, then it is obvious that this system eliminates judges such as those which have been approved for the Polish uh, Supreme uh, Court, so where uh, the College of Judges uh, gave uh, voted against him, uh, other bodies voted against him, but the National Judicial Council approved of that candidate and approved a person who um, had practically zero high-level uh, experience in the judiciary. The uh, current uh, National Judicial Council in Poland only looks at procedural issues. They only look uh, at uh, the application, uh, they only look at the CV of the candidate, and they don't look for any additional opinions on that candidate, and it also votes in camera. And it is very easy to predict uh, the outcomes of the vote if you know who the candidate is. And now, uh, I'm sorry for this lengthy introduction. Now, coming to my question. So, uh, the National Committee for Judge Selection, I understand that it takes the final decision. Does uh, the committee vote on the decision? And how do you appoint the judge after taking the selection? Because in our system, we have a basic problem. So, the relation between the National Judiciary Council and the president. Uh, we came up with the term a president presidential prerogative, which means that the president has the final say or appointing or not appointing a judge, while the Constitution is clear that uh, the National Judiciary Council requests that the president approve a judge, a judge and appoint it, and according to the Constitution, it should be a sheer formality that the president uh, only approves of uh, the decision. So that is why this debate was sparked in Poland. And both the, the uh, Supreme Court and the Supreme Administrative Court and the tri uh, Constitutional Tribunal stated that uh, there is no control over the president. Still, the resolutions of uh, the National Judiciary Con uh, Council used to be controlled by the, national, by the Supreme Administrative Court. And now it is controlled by the Committee for Extraordinary Affairs of the Supreme Court. I'm very sorry. I don't want us to get lost in this question. Uh, yes, yes, I am coming to the end of my query. Why am I mentioning this? Uh, this issue of appointing the judges is important to me. It's interesting to me because it leads to the emergence of a certain problem between uh, the National Judiciary Council and the President uh, in Poland. So what does uh, the Dutch system look like? Is uh, this act of nomination, this uh, appointment, uh, can it be debated? And does uh, the uh, LSR, the National Committee for Judge Selection, have the final say? I understand that there's a... There's a um, Thank you for uh, sorry for taking so much time. If I if I understand the question uh, right, it's about who's appointing after the selection. Um, and but at first, um, my congratulations with your uh, anniversary. Um, uh, well, after the selection, uh, the selection there's uh, there's a vote uh, by the the six people who did, did the hearing, the last hearing, uh, did the interview. And um, uh, and that's uh, in private. So uh, people uh, write it and uh, fill it in. And well, and only the, the chairman, who's an extra chairman, not one of those six, but coming in just to do the voting. So uh, people uh, have a discussion, but don't know the votes of the other five. Uh, after the selection is completed successfully, uh, we send a message to the court. Uh, the, the board of the local court, they do the appointment. So uh, they're responsible that there will be an intake committee. The intake committee 
um, uh, sees how long the education process will be, the education pre periods, and that can be to, uh, from one to four years. And um, um, but uh, the 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 board is not the, the well, they appoint the judge, uh, and there is a formal. Um, um, a point that it goes to the ministry and goes to the to the, to the king because there is a a, a royal decision uh, that you are appointed to be a judge, uh, but there is not something uh, in between. It can only be yes. So uh, it's the the board of the court that makes the decision if the judge will be appointed, and that is. Uh, but the definitely the definite uh, uh, decision, if you will be appointed, is only after your education. So at the end of the education, there is a, uh, an exam, but more or less it's also some kind of peer review. You have to fill in all the things that you did with the reviews of your your the colleagues that did your training. So uh, you're an assistant judge, and the judge that trained you he gives comments. Uh, and, uh, for example, you did some internships, so you went for uh, some weeks or some months to the prosecutor's office, or you went to the police, or you went to some kind of other uh, thing, uh, other organization. You all fill it in, it's in, um, uh, uh, and that's checked, and that's discussed with you, and then there is a final decision made by judges, um, and then there's your uh, appointment for life. So um, thank you very much for this explanation. Yeah, it's a bit long. Sorry. I know it's 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 long, it's but it's it it's all yeah. important. Yeah. I hate to stop our discussion here, but the good news is that we are exactly now moving to to a coffee break. Uh, please join me in thanking our uh, our panelists. Uh, but before I, before we do that, I think our our uh, panelists from Georgia and Ukraine now should have a very simple solution to consider to Im to improve your judicial systems. You need a king. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mihailo. And let's meet each other for the coffee break.
Welcome to the third uh, block of the 12th uh, Court Watch Poland Conference on the Civic Court Monitoring done by our Galant Volunteers. Our volunteers visited um, over 100 courts all around the country this past year. 218 volunteers delivered 3,742 observations from uh, court sessions. Please give them a big hand because this is quite an impressive number. It's higher than uh, it was last year and still growing. I think it bodes well for the years to come. What with the pandemic uh, ending or what with us adapting to it. Anyway, the observations came from various places around the country. In some courts there were more, in some there were fewer observations. It's all in our reports. Uh, the printed versions are available just outside the room. And when it comes to the number of uh, observations, the majority came this past year from Łódź Śródmieście, Toruń, and Warsaw, Praga Północ, uh, district courts. Uh, we um, it, we got several hundred observations from there, followed by Warsaw, Warsaw, Praga, Warsaw, Praga, Południe, and Gdańsk. Over a hundred observations from each. Behind every number, there's a, a person spending their leisure time on visiting courts or connecting live to court sessions and observing the court proceedings for hours. We are very grateful for that. This is uh, the summary of uh, results. For this sample, we took uh, courts with at least 25 observations. The most important questions uh, answered by volunteers are listed here, and uh, we present the average of uh, responses uh, given. The the um, most important question was whether the court uh, gave uh, the parties the floor and uh, listened to their voice. Uh, luckily enough, 99% of um, uh, courts uh, did so. Uh, then justification of uh, the verdict, uh, whether it was um, intelligible, 98% of uh, Courts did that, so whether the parties uh, were treated equally, 97% uh, of courts did so, whether the justification of the verdict was convincing, 96%, uh, and no objection to uh, the minute taking uh, procedure, 96%. Uh, uh, prosecutor absent from uh, the room before and uh, after the session. And uh, we only had a um, small percentage of observations in the case of remaining questions, but still, what with the scale of the judiciary, every percentage point uh, means uh, potentially thousands of sessions with problems. So each time you have to think what to do to avoid such situations from happening. And so more frequently than previously, it 
in the uh, percentage of courts where there were no uh, comments or objections as to the presence of uh, the observer um, was dropping 95%. Uh, then the openness of the session, uh, whether the uh, whether parties and observers uh, could hear the debate well. If the public uh, cannot hear what's going on, potentially the parties cannot either, which uh, jeopardizes the uh, fairness of uh, the uh, proceedings. And the problems uh, here occur in one every 10 cases which is quite a sizable number. Uh, then uh, in 91% of cases only, uh, the sessions uh, put on the docket uh, really took place. So it means that ever more frequently, uh, the uh, trials uh, tend to fall out of the docket. And then mediation or a settlement uh, was uh, offered in 79% of cases. To my mind, uh, it is still a good result because it's always good for the parties uh, if the trial ends in mediation or settlement. And uh, last but not least, the punctual the punctuality of the sessions, 52% uh, of uh, court sessions uh, started on time, which is uh, slightly better than it uh, used to be in the previous years, but still it seems to be a problem. Also, in the case of uh, delay, uh, the judge uh, excused uh, uh, the delay or explain the reasons in any way in 26% of cases. So uh, at least saying uh, um, apologies is in order in such cases. What we are really happy about is uh, the fact that in uh, penal divisions, prosecutors uh, had better conditions of work. They could enter the courtroom before the trial, whereas uh, the parties uh, had to wait outside. Well, it didn't have to be bad necessarily. However, and from the perspective of the uh, accused party, um, it uh, might uh, jeopardize uh, the um, principle of fairness. We monitor this area. And um, for a sample of 35 uh, courts, there were 20% of cases where such a situation took place. At present, uh, it's below 5%. It might be because the prosecutors uh, are not uh, that much present at every court session because they are allowed not to be there, but for sure, the most important thing is the, the change of attitude of the, of the judges themselves uh, to this area. Sometimes it's enough uh, to have a chat with them, explaining uh, what should be done for the things to, cha uh, to, to change. It doesn't call for legal amendments. Also, the punctuality of sessions got better. And the whole sample, the result was 54%, which means that 54% of um, the trials started on time this past year. When it comes to the differences uh, between the courts, in some, punctuality is not much of a problem. In regional courts, to the left, there were many observations. And the higher number of observations, uh, the more robust conclusions might be. For Gdańsk, 81% of trials uh, started on time. In Warsaw, Praga, it was only 30%. 
So still the span is very big and it's even bigger for district courts. 60, there were 64 uh, um, observations in Tychy and 100% of trials started on time. In Sosnowiec, only 11% of uh, uh, trials started on time. In Zielona Góra, out of 85 observations, only 25% um, percent of um, trials started on time. So there's still room for improvement. In Łódź Śródmieście District Courts, uh, we had 500 observations and 75% of trials started on time. It's a vast uh, district court, so lots of cases. Uh, uh, had and still the punctuality is impressive. The results are getting better. The share of punctual trials is higher than it used to be. And also the duration of the delay is uh, shorter. For the whole country, the average is 12 minutes and it used to be 15 previously. Considering the number of uh, trials um, heard every day all around the country, it means one. It, it means hundreds of people waiting for the trial to start. Also, it might be the case uh, that the number of uh, trials is, uh, or the number of uh, cases is shrinking. But it's uh, not true of every. Um, division or district court. Some divisions are inundated with uh, uh, Swiss franc long uh, uh, cases, for instance, uh, so they have to hear a huge number of uh, cases. Unfortunate, uh, unfortunately, this reduction does not pertain uh, to all categories of cases. The duration of delay varies as well. Wood should miss the district court is in the vanguard here because uh, they only delay one uh, trial in four and uh, only by 10 minutes on the average. For Warsaw, it's 17, 18 minutes. And even in the same city, similar, at the city of Poznan, similar, district uh, courts in Nowe Miasto and Wilda, the average was 10 minutes, and in Grunwald Jerzyce, it was 21 minutes. But please remember that with uh, smaller number of observations, we cannot make uh, very robust conclusions. If uh, the delay happened, uh, did anyone apologize for that? It uh, happened uh, very frequently in Nova Sąd and much less frequently in the district court of Wrocław. Well, this morning, I mentioned how uh, much we care about uh, the uh, rights uh, of the public to attend open trials. Well, what, about, what with the pandemic, I uh, mentioned um, certain situations this morning, but pandemic, what, the pandemic was not the only uh, uh, factor, unfortunately. There seem, seem to be other reasons for curbing the right to open trial. One of uh, the other reasons which m might seem very neutral at first glance is starting uh, trials before the planned time. The planned uh, time is uh, very important for the pub for the public and for the journalists, not only for the parties. In Poland, we only enter the room when we are summoned, when the session starts. And uh, 
it's not good for anyone to enter the courtroom during the trial. And such a person might not uh, know that uh, the trial started five or seven minutes uh, before. So if the case uh, start, uh, if the case uh, hearing of the trial starts before time, uh, somebody uh, who's indeed punctual, who's in time, might not uh, make it into the courtroom. Also, uh, there's uh, the right to civic monitoring of court sessions. One of the observers uh, told us that in one of the penal uh, divisions uh, in Warsaw, the judge uh, prevented uh, the observer from uh, making, taking notes. Uh, she said that uh, he was not an assessor and she's not going to be assessed. And the volunteer said uh, uh, that he was from Courtwatch and the judge replied that they should have informed her about the attendance of a volunteer uh, beforehand. So at first, she demanded uh, declaration of uh, affiliation and then uh, she uh, said that uh, it was not right that such an organization was there. I don't know what the volunteer in question uh, thought about it and how he felt about it, but it was not really um, very um, encouraging to exercising the rights uh, to uh, the public trial. And the injured party uh, said that he was okay with the presence of the volunteer. So at the end of the day, the judge uh, allowed the uh, observer, the volunteer, to stay. But he was not welcome. And clearly, after such treatment, uh, that observer wouldn't uh, come to any further trials uh, run by the said judge. So. When confronted with negative reactions, volunteers uh, would avoid that judge, would rather favor judges uh, with more friendly attitude. As a result, the, the uh, conclusions might not be very representative because the observed sessions will be only uh, run by the more friendly judges. Another case from Warsaw. Uh, the the judge uh, deferred uh, the uh, case, informed the parties uh, about it, and then turned to me and other students saying, ladies, you're not welcome to come. And it was uh, confirmed by another observer present at the very same trial. This is the very same trial. The judge uh, allowed me and the rest of the public to stay, but uh, he wasn't happy that uh, we are attending his session again. At the end, uh, he said that he sincerely hoped that we are not coming again. And if we are coming for the third time, uh, he'll, uh, he uh, won't think uh, it as a coincidence. It uh, sounded like a threat. Or at least it sounded uh, ambiguously. Another example of a similar situation, two persons at the same session, again, uh, also Praga Południe, District Court, uh, the Labor and Social Insurance Division. With every question, every word of the judge, we felt more humiliated, as if we were doing something bad and everybody was looking at us. Another observer said that after they were told to leave the room, we all decided that we felt humiliated by the High Court. If it were my first court session, then probably uh, it would be my last because I would be too um, scared and discouraged uh, uh, by the whole situation. So it was uh, clearly very unpleasant what they heard from the judge. Another interesting example. showing the aftertaste uh, such situation as uh, leave. I took another person who wanted to 
watch uh, uh, volunteers uh, uh, work with me. And it's good for other people to uh, watch uh, the judiciary and, and volunteers at work. Well, after all, the sessions are open. I wanted to introduce her into the topic. After we were told to leave, when I said I was sorry because it shouldn't be, uh, um, it's uh, it, uh, her first time shouldn't look like that, she replied to me, but this was the best thing I uh, could see and experience about the judiciary uh, in Poland. Well, maybe not the best. It doesn't mean it was good. It uh, meant uh, uh, very educative. So situations where the public is discouraged, accumulated when uh, they are interviewed uh, by uh, the judge or they are told that they need a special consent uh, or affiliation with a specific organization certainly put uh, people off from participating in open hearings. Meanwhile, this uh, could help build confidence uh, in uh, the judicial system. That's the best way to build trust, to base it on interpersonal direct relations and first impressions. And we had a lot of positive uh, examples, uh, for example, positive reactions uh, to observers. One example from Lublinets, uh, the judge asked me if it was my hobby to participate uh, in uh, court hearings. I replied that uh, I am an observer, I uh, work uh, I volunteer for the foundation, and the judge said that um, he knows the foundation and he believes that it is doing a very important job because Poles are not aware of their rights. And he also said that he was very happy that I am spending my time observing uh, the functioning of the judicial system, and he told me that I should really continue with this work. So this approach of the judge is building confidence of the society in the judicial system. Another example, the uh, judge, Jerzy Bess, took his time to explain uh, the case and uh, explain the verdict to me after uh, the hearing um, was completed. It never happened to me in at any other court, so a big thank you to Judge Bess. The next issue, whether the parties, the participants could hear each other and the judge well during the hearing. Perhaps we're not sure of how we should understand this uh, criterion. So I wanted to give you examples of specific situations. The injured party was an elderly person, and he couldn't understand the judge. Uh, we had masks, uh, and uh, there were there were also plastic uh, partition walls uh, due to the pandemic, and he couldn't hear uh, what the judge was saying. In such a situation, it's very important uh, to use um, microphones or a sound system. I believe that could resolve many problems. Another example, there was an echo in the courtroom. Everyone was wearing masks. We couldn't hear anyone well, the judge or the witnesses. Uh, the room uh, had uh, a microphone system, but uh, either they were broken or they were switched off. So the participant uh, couldn't comprehend why the microphones were switched off. Uh, I can't hear the speaker from the audience because uh, he's not using a microphone. M Mr. President explained that the microphones are not for the people, they're for the courts. So maybe we could initiate some efforts for using microphones in the courtroom, especially that now we have these plastic partition walls. I'm certain that this is possible because if we can have a lang uh, an English and Polish uh, conference with the guests from Ukraine, then certainly courts can use microphones. Another example, uh, we had microphones, but um, they we couldn't use them because they were switched off. In criminal cases, there are no uh, recordings of uh, the hearings, so the microphones are only used 
if uh, there is a very big courtroom and uh, um, and you can't hear somebody from the other side of the room. Still, you have to switch them on. And the judge uh, didn't uh, help us understand the hearing because uh, uh, he was very um, his speech was very unclear. So it's uh, important to have good pronunciation. We also ask observers to assess the impartiality of judges. Uh, we had very few negative observations. Only 1% uh, reported reservations concerning court impartiality. Still, uh, this 1% was made up of uh, very many observations because we had a large-scale study. Let me give you some examples from the perspective of the observers and perhaps also the witnesses. The observer recalls, I have some concerns about differences in the equal treatment of uh, the accused party and uh, the uh, police officer who was uh, the witness. Uh, the injured uh, party uh, Sorry, the judge approached uh, the injured party uh, with uh, aggression. He would interrupt the injured party and claim that these statements were too long, though the judge would interrupt at the very beginning of uh, the uh, intervention. And when the injured party wanted to clarify uh, certain aspects, the judge would not let him do that. Still, the policewoman, the police officer, uh, could testify freely. It's unfair uh, to limit possibilities of making statements for one party and let the other party speak freely. And also the manner, the uh, behavior of uh, the uh, judge was unacceptable. So any aggression, any expressions of anger are unacceptable. And especially the defense counsels uh, point to the fact uh, that uh, uh, public servants such as uh, police officers uh, are given certain privileges at the court. So this could lead to perceiving courts uh, as not being impartial, al although the judge is really trying uh, to keep up uh, his impartiality. Maybe they, the judge only wants uh, to conduct uh, the hearing in an effective and fast manner. Perhaps uh, the observer does not know what is important uh, to the judge. Still, it is important uh, to the injured party because uh, they can be sentenced uh, as a result of that uh, trial. But the instructions uh, can be given in a more polite way. Another example also from a criminal division, because most of these uh, reservations concerning impartiality were reported by observers uh, from uh, criminal uh, divisions, because, perhaps because they're very inquisition-like. Uh, so the observer recalls, uh, to me, this is the first hearing where I can clearly see that the judge is not impartial. He is not interested in additional evidence. And I think if there were no members of the public at the hearing, the judge would treat the injured party uh, very unfairly because he would not like to learn about the injured party's perspective on the case. And this is a completely different court, completely different case and different observer. Another example, the, son, the court did not let witnesses testify freely, and the answers suggested the desired uh, the questions uh, suggested desired answers to the question. And uh, the questions were very unilateral. The court also expressed uh, his or her emotions uh, towards uh, the statements. Again, a different court, different case, different city, different observer. But this follows a certain iterative pattern. And I think this should be more closely examined. So we need to look at how these hearings are conducted at criminal divisions. how uh, the judges can convince uh, all the participants uh, that uh, the 
trial or the hearing was held in a fair manner. Another example, the uh, court was expressly negatively expressly negative towards uh, the injured party. He was ironic and uh, would show that uh, the judge is embarrassed uh, by uh, the statements of the injured party. So again, another observation from a criminal division. And that would indicate unfair, uh, lack of impartiality. Another example, the judge was uh, angry at uh, the uh, petitioner for bringing the case before the court. And the judge was uh, also unpleased, displeased with the fact uh, that uh, the uh, petitioner did not uh, prepare uh, the exhibits uh, properly because they were mixed up and she couldn't find the right order. While uh, the judge was uh, very polite and kind to the other party. So we shouldn't have such a condescending behavior from the judge uh, towards the uh, petitioner. And the observer can tell that the, the judge is not impartial and can't even hide it in his or her behavior and is giving instructions to the party which uh, provides grounds for thinking that the judge is impartial. Now, the whole area of how participants of the hearings are treated, we've always focused on this area. But it is, uh, but work in this area is never sufficient because uh, we need to look at how observers, how participants, how the public assess the hearings. Because if the judge does not uh, treat participants with respect, those participants will not respect the court and will not have confidence in the judicial system. Respect is therefore very important and should supplement equal treatment. We have a negative example here from a civil division in Torun. The presiding judge was very nervous and uh, was not composed during the hearing. Uh, she tried to follow the agenda, but uh, she introduced a very nervous and agitated atmosphere. It was very unple unpleasant. and. Uh, I have to say that uh, she was uh, not uh, conducting the hearing well, and her behavior was not uh, suitable or appropriate. And although the observer admits uh, that uh, one of the parties uh, to the case was a difficult person, and uh, though there were some reasons uh, behind this uh, nervousness, the judge should not behave that way. Another example from a criminal division, uh, the judge uh, was uh, impolite and even aggressive. Uh, she was uh, very uh, nervous when some of the parties said that they didn't understand something. The witness trembled and was very uh, stressed. Uh, some people who visit courts for the first time who do not know how to behave in such a setting often experience fear. When we ask our observers about their first experience with courts, uh, they recall, I was afraid, I uh, felt a fear, I was concerned about how this visit would go. This fear abides as uh, observers visit courts more frequently, but those people are probably experiencing a court for the first and last time, and they will only remember that the judge treated them badly. A positive example to get to give you an experience on a on a lighter note. Uh, the reporting judge Zbigniew Puszkarski seemed interested, uh, listened carefully, uh, was friendly, had a friendly tone, and was kind towards uh, the parties. Another important offer: due process. So building confidence in the public and encouraging them to contact courts in the future. It's important for the parties to feel that they have been heard out thoroughly and that the judge has examined their case in detail. We can see that the judge here was a 
an active listener and showed interest. Let's go back to the negative examples. An example from a criminal division in Toruń. Uh, oh, I've already read this example, so let me move on to the next one. An example from Warsaw and Gdańsk. Oh, a positive example again. The, the, the judge was uh, kind and friendly towards the accused party, and at the same time, the judge was assertive. As a result, the hearing went smoothly and calmly, but at the same time, the judge controlled the situation. After an hour, the uh, judge suggested that the witness take a seat while testifying. This was an observation from a hearing conducted by Judge Anna Kuzai uh, from Warsaw. Another example from Gdańsk. On the one hand, the judge was uh, objective. On the other hand, uh, she was uh, very polite and very kind towards all the parties. Another positive example from Katowice this time. The judge responded to all uh, the uh, questions of uh, the petitioner in a very exhaustive manner. The uh, judge explained her rights, what would happen if uh, she introduced uh, changes to her petition, and also stipulated what deadline she had to meet. So it's very important uh, for uh, people without uh, professional legal advisors or legal counsels is an important element of the code of ethics for judges and assistant judges. And this should always, uh, and such explanations should always be provided when a party does not have a legal counsel. This makes a great impression on observers, and it is not frequently the case. Therefore, we wanted to present this example. The witness was more than 80 years old, and she was using a wheelchair. She was speaking very slowly, and we could see that she was very sick. The judge, Bożena Baraniak, was full of understanding and very patient. She explained all her rights. Another positive example from Warsaw. The presiding judge had to speak very loudly so that the elderly woman could hear her. But at no moment did the judge show that she was irritated by this fact, even if she had to repeat the question a couple of times. So the witness apologized for being hard of hearing, but the judge uh, told the woman that there was nothing to be sorry for and uh, and thanked for her for appearing before the court because she knew that it was difficult to afford the witness. So Judge Anna Ptaszek really showed a positive attitude. She thought that she was grateful towards the witness for devoting her time to the case. And she underlined that such witnesses were very valuable to the judicial system. And an observation from a hearing held by Judge Dominique Monka. This judge has been mentioned frequently in the report and at our conferences. This assistant judge makes an incredible impression on our observers. The assistant judge, as always, was very careful when listening uh, to uh, the participants of uh, the uh, hearing, and he treated everyone fairly. He was very uh, polite and uh, provided all the necessary legal explanations. I believe uh, that uh, he became a judge because uh, he had a true calling to take up this function. I would like to, to read only such positive observations that they met um, a real, a great judge, and that they gained confidence in the judicial system. And uh, 
Dominique Moncay is only an assistant judge, so he's only embarking on his uh, journey to become towards becoming a judge. So we wanted to show these examples to inspire you to thank these uh, judges who are so exceptional. And we also wanted to point to to the failures of the judicial system, which uh, question the confidence building in the judiciary, because uh, these are then passed on to our friends, uh, to our family in informal conversations, and they undermine trust towards courts. People draw conclusions from their personal experience. That is why we have uh, to make this court experience a positive one for everyone. And I wanted to point out these elements uh, which uh, the judges have influence over, for example, to fairly treat the parties, to treat all the parties with respect to provide explanations. Those are the major elements which influence the level of confidence towards courts in people who have uh, had a court experience. And I hope that all contacts with Polish courts will contribute to higher confidence levels. And I'm happy that every year we can share these observations. And we can do this thanks to our volunteers. We would like to thank them. I would like to ask Roxana Sidniewska, coordinator of uh, the foundation, to join me on stage and to thank our wonderful collaborators. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot say hi, how um, pleased I am that uh, I can tell you about our wonderful volunteers. It's thanks to the court watchers that we can achieve the mission of our foundation day in, day out. It is thanks to their dedication that we can grow, implement our projects, and uh, run our large-scale research. In the past year, we had as many as 218 volunteers. They sacrificed their leisure time to watch the trials, court sessions to monitor the court infrastructure and uh, embark on other watch-related actions. They also provided mental support to the participants of uh, the trials who, thanks to the presence, did not feel alone in the courtroom. I'm also very happy that those young people providing civil monitoring of uh, the courts treated it as a great adventure. We value very much our talks, exchange of experience and observations. I'm very happy to be able to give recognition to the most active volunteers at this point. Active, not uh, just measured by the number of observations, but uh, by the dedication, effort, and uh, time they spent uh, with Court Watch uh, Poland. Let's start with those who couldn't be here today. I hope they are following our onla uh, us online. So let me read uh, the names. Urszula Mazurek, Dominika Konopka, Karolina Gomułka, Wiktoria Piasecka, and Wojciech Krześniak, Adam Schultz, Łukasz Górny, and Michał szymanderski pastryk
Thank you very much for this round of applause. And now over to those who are here in the room. We'd like to give them the recognition they deserve. Patrycja Ptaszek. Halina Kusztwardowska. Olivia Dyka. Ewelina Żarczyńska. And Daniel Wydmuch. Damian Błaszka. As well as uh, David Mariasik. We have uh, gifts for you. We are very grateful to the sponsors of uh, our program. Suniva will tell you more about them now. Good afternoon. Roxana is uh, handing in the awards. So let me just wait a bit. Roxana already thanked uh, our volunteers. So I'd like to give uh, thanks to institutions and persons who made it possible for the volunteers to receive all those gifts. Let's look at logos of uh, those institutions and uh, organizations. There they are. So the gifts uh, for our volunteers were founded by CMS law firm, Wolters Kluver, also our partner in uh, legal education, Beck Publishing House. This year, they uh, are funding the awards uh, for us for the first time, let's hope not the last, and uh, Many Mornings, which funded uh, those beautiful funny socks for our volunteers. I'd also like to give recognition to two law firms uh, behind organizing this uh, conference. Allen and Overy. You heard uh, from uh, attorney Carolina Weiss, uh, the representative of the said law firm in the panel. Thanks to them for the second time we could organize uh, this conference in this beautiful venue. We've been collaborating with uh, them in our education projects like Oxford's uh, debates. Also, Domajski Zakrzewski Palinka with attorney Paweł Lewandowski speaking in the first panel. We've been collaborating with him for a few years already. Jointly, we published uh, a report on uh, opportunities and threats of uh, courts accessible online. Also, Oknoplast our partner for many years in legal education, and Museum Warszawy, the Warsaw Museum, our partner in organizing the Oxford Debate Tournament. I'd like to thank all our individual donors as well. Thank you for choosing to support us and our mission 
to make courts accessible and friendly for all and to make the judiciary focused on the human. I'd like to thank all those who are here in the room and watching us online. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you for being with us. And the last slide. Thank you. A big thank you. Now over to Roxana for a second and over to Bartosz for an official closure. I'd like to invite one more person who was a major support in writing reports and translating them on a voluntary basis. Samuel Shannon, you deserve recognition as well. Please come here and join us. Thank you very much for your participation. I think we should give a big hand to the volunteers, the panelists, and all of you participating and asking your very good questions. Thank you, and see you next year.